Zaffa presents Killing Jericho, written by William Hussey and read by Damian Lynch. Chapter 1 I finally kicked the chap out of bed around noon. So I suppose I should tell you right off. Travelling show people have their own secret tongue, a rich and mystifying jargon designed to keep outsiders at bay. You'll pick it up by instinct as we go on, but here's a start. Chap. Noun. A general dog's body, usually male, who travels and works on the fair but is not himself a showman. Christ, he yawned, spearing an elbow into my ribs and rolling Michelangelo buttocks off the mattress. All right, I'm going. God, if only you'd been this energetic last night. I shrugged acknowledging his critique. For two months I'd barely moved from my trailer, a rickety tin box built around the time Neil Armstrong hitched up his wagon and took the human race on tour. Yet, somehow I'd retain the arms of a stevedore and a physique that could still turn ahead. The chap stepped into his briefs. Early twenties we'd picked him up somewhere around Hampstead, a student earning a few quid on his summer break by working the London circuit. I was groggy that morning, my brain half buried in benzos, my body aching from a clearly unappreciated night of going through the motions. But there were patterns even I could read. A smudged ballpoint scrawl on his left hand, dash 2009, dash 1, dash AC 302, dash a court of appeal citation, so a law student, leather wallet with initials embossed in gold, a studiously torn picture of a handsome middle-aged woman in the sleeve as he flipped it open and checked his cash. A figure cut out. A father disowned? I grunted at myself. Assumptions are your Achilles' heels, Scott, my old mentor, D.I. Pete Garris, had once told me. You should always back up those hunches of yours. Cleverness will only get you so far. Catch you later, then, the chap said pushing a tumble of dirty blonde hair out of his eyes. Maybe we can have a drink or something? Your treat? Your dad doesn't pay enough for me to splash out on booze every night? We'll see, I muttered. Now get out of it. I need to sleep. It was all about sleep, after all. That was why I'd fucked him and then swallowed quadruple my Zopiclone prescription all washed down with a corpse of a coffee I'd found decomposing on the kitchen counter. Like every night, I longed for that complete exhaustion where sleep comes fast and dreamless. Zack threw me an indulgent smile and closed the door while I rolled onto my side, blinking at my reflection in the glass of an empty picture frame that sat on the bedside table. A nest of blue-black curls, strong features and unfinished stroke away from pretty, a pair of artless grey eyes that would make Caravaggio swoon. I've tried to be many things in my 31 years. Reluctant fairground showman, earnest student, hired bone breaker, CID detective, cleaner of prison toilets, and, through it all, my looks haven't betrayed an ounce of hardship. Maybe that's because I haven't stuck at anything. To be fair... Before I found the Malinowski children roasted alive in the back bedroom of their father's shop, I had been a pretty conscientious detective. But as to the rest, the years and the rust just roll off me. Grunting, I tipped the picture frame face down and turned onto my back. Tucked away in the corral of trailers at the rear of the fairground, the only distinct sound I could hear was an ancient generator gasping itself to pieces. There was the ever-present song of the fair, of course, the somewhat sinister jangle of the carousel's calliope mixed in with jabs of dance music from the waltzer and the rattle, roar and shake of the rides. If your ears are accustomed, it's almost a lullaby you can drift off to. The sun beat through the blinds. My eyes hazed, my body uncoiled. And then... A blade of light played across the police file sitting on the table at the far end of the trailer, and suddenly my heart was in my throat, a fevered pulse ticking behind my tongue. 
All at once I could smell it again. The sting of unburned petrol. The stew of charred children. A stink that eighteen months could not erase. In my mind, I was back in the street, ducking under the blue and white cordon. I saw myself signing my name into the scene log, D.C. Scott Jericho, long looping letters, full of the swagger of a know-nothing deer who thought he could bring sense out of any horror. Forensics whispered by in their Tyvek suits, all their usual gallows humour missing. I knew the reason. I'd been the night duty detective and had taken the call. Even the most sociopathic Socko knows not to joke when it's a kiddie case. I dotted the eye in Jericho and strode into the burned-out shop, past guarded doorways, through to the living quarters at the back, nitrile gloved hands at my sides, my mind clearing away the clutter of our team and the fire brigade's own forensics unit. I started to sweat. A little rill ran down from my paper hood, the only moisture in this scorched memory of a home. The other officers fell back from the bedroom door as I approached, not badly damaged, I noticed, strange how fires behave, and let me through with a reverence that had nothing to do with me, a lowly detective constable, and everything to do with the clot of misery and despair that waited inside. The room felt like a holy place long abandoned. There were relics everywhere, twisted, melted things whose purpose only an archaeologist might have been able to reconstruct. Cheery in the gloom, yellow evidence markers surrounded the remains of a big, bow-chested wardrobe. The forensics team gave a collective sigh as I reached out and pulled the double doors aside. I frowned then, both in the trailer, where I sat huddled like a tramp in winter, and in the memory. Something had dragged itself into the wardrobe and curled up like a butterfly in its chrysalis. It took moments to pick the illusion apart, to see that the something had originally been three somethings. I think I might then have whispered, no, or fuck, or God. Three dead kids, arms pulled up like playground boxes, eyes tight shut, drawn together in their love and terror and desperation. They were with me now in the trailer, a trio of hazy presences standing in the shadows by the door, their eyes full of sorrow and disappointment. Sometimes the Malinovsky children spoke to me. Mostly they kept their counsel. As their memory fractured, so did these phantoms, drifting away like motes of charred skin on the breeze until I was alone again. I rose slowly to my feet, padded barefoot to the end of the trailer. Garris in his fucking files. Had he come yesterday? Surely I'd have remembered that interfering old bastard picking his way through the garbage of my life and finding a space for himself to perch. I scanned the trailer and saw a cleared nook on the built-in settee. Yes, he'd sat there, between the mounds of my old books and a fortnight's worth of laundry. But when exactly had he visited? No idea. I'd asked. If he had to bring cases I'd never review, could he at least put them in a non-official folder? Garris hadn't asked why. Human details were as ever unimportant to him. He just wanted a bit of off-the-record assistance from his former protégé. I stared now at the manila sleeve. A new case. A fresh way to fail. I didn't even open the cover. Tearing the slim contents in two, I was about to shove the lot into the bin when Sal burst through the door. I've known Sal Myers since forever, We'd been traveller chavvies together, our early childhood explorations covering a vast terrain of half-assembled rides, delicate fingers searching where they shouldn't. Now, Sal blew a strand of auburn hair from her face and surveyed the wreckage of my trailer. Something had driven her here in a hurry, and she looked royally pissed off. At first, I wondered if it was the recent departure of Zack, and, although that turned out not to be the case, she must have seen him leaving, and the news that brought her was momentarily forgotten. Sal looked around with the kind of expression she'd usually reserve for the most Dinlow of Joskins. Dinlow, adjective, fuckwitted. Joskin, noun. Anyone not a member of the travelling life, especially those that live in houses. I was sweating badly from the flashback. My back honeyed with it. 
jewels gleaming in my chest hair. Had another one up here, then? She locked freckly arms over the bib of her work dungarees. If you're trying to embarrass your dad, you can stop right now. The poor old mush is already walking around like he wants the ground to eat him up. Didn't think you were so intolerant, I muttered. I know some round here are stuck in the 19th century, but you... Don't give me that middle-class Joskin bollocks, she spat back. No one here cares who you sleep with. I didn't believe that. Not entirely. For all their talk of being outsiders, the fairground has its own conservativeness. It holds its people close and likes them to be of a certain type. If divergence exists, then such activities are to be carried out in the shadows. Screw whoever you like, Sal continued. In a fairly ineffectual way, she started cleaning up. Dishes splashed into the heaving sink, fairy liquid added to the toxic jumble. That's not what gets your dad down. It's this. Weak old shirts that can stand up on their own. Pizza boxes that look like biology experiments. And yes, you poking every slag in sight. That wasn't fair on Zack. Nor most of the others. I opened my mouth to argue, but didn't get past the first syllable. I don't know, Scott, she sighed. Maybe you should just go. My Jody, she idolises you. Draws you pictures, bakes you cakes, but I daren't send her round here for fear of what she'll find. Really? I think Jodie's got a broader mind than her mother. Dragging a pair of blue jeans off the floor, I hitched them over my hips, towed my outsized feet into a pair of sandals, and pulled on a grubby white vest. Dishes crashed under Sal's hands, and she turned on me, cheeks flushed. So... She should just walk in and see you lying spaced out in that pit of a bed. She's seven years old, for Christ's sake. Look, Scott, I've tried. We all have. When you came out of prison, we did everything we could for you. And don't forget, we never begged you to come back here. I took a breath. Sal, I had nowhere else to go. Course you didn't. If you did, you'd probably never have seen your father again. There was no answer to that. She had me nailed with a kind of killer observation that, in my CID days, I'd have reserved for a final interview clincher. My instincts were slow, as I've told you. My gifts, whatever they actually amount to, a shadow of those that had once so impressed Pete Garris that he'd cajoled me into joining the force. Even so, I knew that something was wrong. What is it? I scratched the heel of my hand through the dark bristle of my jaw. You didn't come here just to call me a Joskin. Skirting around her, I flicked open the door, cleared the trailer step, and headed for the trestle table I'd set up outside. I poured a bowl of summer warm water from a canister and was about to soap my face when Sal laid a hand on my shoulder. He's here, she said. The skinhead. They found him parnium behind the swing boats like some jook marking its territory. Ted and Johnny are guarding him right now. A skinhead? My laughter was hollow. I knew who she meant. Fuck's that got to do with me? Glancing up, I saw a blue bottle at the trailer window. It bobbed and danced there like the resurrected on the Day of Judgment. It's the one you put in the hospital, she said. That fascist fuck who set the fire and killed them little Polish kids. Sal's voice came to me as if she was standing in another room. It's Kerrigan. Chapter 2 Don't! Sal's hand against my chest. Don't give that murdering bastard an excuse to call the gathers. You fight him, they'll have you back inside, and pretty soon after, Kerrigan will come for the last pot you pissed in. I pushed her arm away and she gripped my wrist, her fingers loops of pale steel. You won't come back out again. You hear me, Scotty? You'll die in there this time. In there, out here, what's the difference? I shrugged, realising it was the first honest thing I'd said to her since she'd picked me up from HMP Hazelhurst two months earlier. Pulling free, I strode out along the backs of the joints, running now, jumping over trailer couplings. A few old aunts and grandmothers called to me from their steps and deck chairs, excitement piping in their cracked voices. 
They were attuned to the motions of their world and knew when a good punch-up was in the offing. Out from behind the side ground where the shooting galleries and mirror mazes stood, I jumped the rail of Earnshaw's dodgems. Sparks brawled in the electric cage overhead as I zigzagged between the riders. One of the chaps rodeoing the back of a bumper car shouted a warning to his boss, and big Sam Earnshaw swarmed out of his booth and caught me by the elbow. This barrel-chested showman hooked something in my eye, the same signal the aunts had noticed, and in an instant, understood. You gonna ruck someone? He hollered over the racket of his ride. I shrugged. Does the old man know? I doubt it. He whistled and Sam Jr. raced over. I'd left the life when I was 19, soon after my mother died, and not having grown up with this new generation, I was viewed by them with suspicion. They knew my history, that I'd snubbed my heritage and become as near as dammit with Judas when I joined the force. Yet still, I was one of them, and little Sam gave me a tight smile. Go find Jericho, his father instructed. Tell him his son's on the warpath. On your toes now. The kid set off like a whippet. I didn't want my dad in attendance, but it's seldom a showman can have a ruck to himself, so I quickly moved on. Whistles trailed me as other showmen vaulted their counters and stepped in behind. No one asked where we were going or why, they just knew something was about to go down. We'd come out of a line of side stalls when Sal caught up. She didn't try to argue or pull me away, just marched at my side. Ahead, it seemed that even the punters had begun to catch on, and they began to make a path for our procession. Danger's always been part of affairs allure, right from the days of the knife throwers and boxing shows, yet those pantomimes were never really what drew the crowds. Joskins know, you see? Deep down they're aware that travellers live outside the rules by which their own lives are governed, and that, if they go to the fair, perhaps they might catch a glimpse of that older, truer danger. Now they lined our route, parents clutching small hands, kids with eyes as round as ferris wheels. Kerrigan came into view. He was leaning against a miniature Wild West wagon, part of a set of carousel vehicles. He flashed a grin when he clocked me and jumped down from the ride's runaboard. Aside from the absence of the plastic mask that had held his shattered cheekbone in place, he hadn't changed much since I'd last seen him in the witness box at my trial. He sauntered over and held out a sunburned hand. Against that reddened skin, the swastika tattoo shone like a brand. A foolish mistake of youth, he told us in his first interview. That lie had been accompanied by his trademark smirk, a sideways tilt of the lips which, within twelve hours, would earn him the most vicious beating he'd ever taken. He'd whimpered then, trembling in the corner of the interview room, pissing his station-issue trousers while half a dozen officers hauled me into the corridor. Lenny Kerrigan showed no fear now, simply sighed and dropped his unshaken hand into his pocket. Ah, but you're a bad loser, Scott. It took me ages to track you down, and now I'm here. You can't even play nice. Maybe I ought to get my lads together and give you a lesson in... He stopped. He had made a serious miscalculation. In the world into which he had stepped, family is family, and even the blackest sheep will be protected. It's the traveller's way. Their code, almost. There are tales told here, and no matter whisper of paedophiles and women killers who dared to enter this world, of high buildings and hidden foundations that would make a mafioso's hair curl. My people are, by and large, what they seem, generous purveyors of entertainment. Just don't presume too much on their smile. While Lenny had been playing the Joker, reinforcements had swarmed in behind me. Thirty or more circled the carousel, men with limbs toughened by labour unknown to the scum that made up the Knights of St. George, Lenny's hate group. Leader Lenny shared the same cartoonish physicality as his followers. Trapezius muscles hunched up to his ears, biceps ribboned with veins, a head so disproportionate to his inflated body, my ancestors might have exhibited him in a pinhead sideshow. 
brought an army along, he swallowed. Same as always, eh? First, you had the filth to back you up, and now you've gone and rolled out the whole carnival. His bravado was as airy as the drifts of candy floss that wafted on the breeze. What are you doing here? I asked. Free country, innit? Thought I'd scout the place out. Might bring me lad along at the weekend. Loves his rides, my boy. He had a son roughly the same age as the Malinovsky girl, Sonia. We tried that angle in the second interview, a gambit of Garris's that hadn't paid off. Usually the sly old fox was good at reading people, finding chinks in the most psychopathic armour, but he'd misjudged Kerrigan. No appeal to common fatherly feeling had shaken that shit-eating grin. I'm not a fan of pikeys as a rule, he continued, but I can make an exception for an old mate. You're looking well, D.C. Jericho. I nodded. Wish I could say the same. He'd had the best reconstructive surgery money could buy. The fact I'd had to sell my house after the civil case he'd brought against me was a testament to that. Still, I'd jumbled his deck pretty nicely, and there's only so much a surgeon can do when some of the cards are missing. Fair play, he shrugged. Honestly, though, I weren't expecting you to lose it like that over a couple of deep-fried poles. It's funny, looking back, that old scarecrow Garris just sitting there while you lost your fucking mind. Thought he knew you, I bet. He's golden boy. I wonder if he's still proud of you, even though you fucked his case and made him look like a proper cunt. But I got you both, didn't I? Lost in his victory, he dared to come within striking distance of those twitching fists that had done him so much damage. You winding up inside, and him brought low. That, I sketched a smile, that had nothing to do with you. I lost it, I failed. Garris is still working, still putting little psychos like you away. All you did was push a lit rag through a letterbox, then scream and cry and piss yourself when I smacked you about. Spittle flew. Careful what you say. Call me a murderer and I'll see you back in court. Sal laughed and pressed her small body between us. Get out of here, she said, looking Kerrigan up and down. You're a no-mark coward and that's all you are. The smirk reappeared. I'm not the one hiding behind two dozen dirty pikeys. No, I nodded. You hide behind a balaclava and a greedy lawyer. Do you know what he did when he was inside? Kerrigan whirled on the spot, arms outstretched. This pissy little faggot. Know how he made friends up at Hazelhurst? I've got all the stories if you want to hear them. What'll happen when I tell your friends, Jericho? Think they'll still stick up for you after I paint them a picture of you on your knees? Tell them. There was a stirring in the ranks. Although whether it was anger at Kerrigan or disgust at what they were hearing, I couldn't say. Finally, he dropped his arms. They probably won't care, whatever they hear. All half-breeds anyway. He moved to step out of the circle, then lunged in as if to nut me. I inclined my head, like a priest keen to hear a penitent's confession. You know it was nothing personal, right? He hushed in my ear. Them kids didn't have to go that way. If only their old man had stayed in his third world shit all. But they won't listen, Jericho. None of them. Get out, I whispered back. One minute more on this ground and I will murder you. Do you understand, Kerrigan? I will murder you. He pushed past me, and just like that, it was over. The hands clasped my shoulder, and I listened to the catcalls that accompanied Kerrigan off the ground. A few would probably tail him to his car, but there'd be no violence. They knew my position, and more importantly, that of my dad. Old man Jericho was the boss of the firm, the one who negotiated with the authorities for our licenses to trade, permissions that can be revoked at the first hint of disorder. All right, son, Sam Earnshaw approached. Little Sam says your dad's gone back to the yard to pick up a lorry. I can't get him on his phone. 
I wasn't listening. My blood was up. Kerrigan's arrival at almost the same moment as a flashback of the Malinovsky case wasn't a huge coincidence. He might have turned up at virtually any point over the past two months and caught me mid-nightmare, but why come at all? Had he tracked me down just to taunt me? That wasn't his style. Oh, sure, he'd lay in an insult or two, but they'd almost certainly be doled out in some lonely alley where he and twenty of his goons had gathered in advance. So why wander into the fair alone and unguarded? Once I might have been able to guess, but my brain was an idle, lumbering thing. It needed exercise. I scanned the crowd. Noise everywhere. Music, laughter, the clack of barley in the neighbouring field, the tattle of tokens. I took a breath. Tasted oil, sweat, axle grease, aerated sugar, the dull smack of a chap's cheap aftershave. There. At the corner of the helter-skelter, I saw him, watching as intently as he himself was watched. My heart pounded, and for the first time in a long time, my mind craved a puzzle. A small one, just to get the juices flowing. Where are you going? Sal asked, as I made to step away. Look, why don't you come back to the trailer? Jody, would love to see you. Can't, I shot back. Something I need to do. I lurched off away from Big Sam and Sal Myers, in pursuit now of a second monster who would come to the fair. Chapter 3 The skills of a showman are born of his trade. First, he must hone the ability to speak the spiel, to chat the chat, to gain the confidence of every kind of punter. Second, his business is observation. A fair might run a week, but there'll only be a few golden hours each night in which his living must be earned. In that time, he'll assess tiny gestures, the flutter of a finger over a pocket, the evidence of cash already spent in the form of sugared lips and torn ticket stubs, the firm or carefree steerage of a child. Third, and most importantly, he'll know human nature. The fair is the last great leveller, all human life passes through our turnstiles, and, over centuries, we've learned their ways, their quirks and commonalities, the patterns that perhaps only priests and showmen can read. Some of these gifts I acquired in my first 18 years living the life, others seem hardwired into me. Strange thing is, it wasn't until Pete Garris pointed it out that I realised these were also the skills of a gifted detective. I put them to use now. For obvious reasons, paedophiles are attracted to fairgrounds. Not the show people ever give them much of a chance. A strongly worded warning usually sends them on their way. And so I followed this specimen to the northbound exit. He wasn't your typical nonce. He walked with a twitchy gait, his appearance stark among the crowd. A Mohican with flame-dyed side panels, chin-piercing, Retro Stone's T-shirt hanging off his toothpick torso, pinstripe trousers and neon green trainers. Almost as if he wanted to be noticed. The fairground fell away, and we entered the churned-up field that served as a temporary car park. The families clustered around their saloons, mums and dads distracted by the complexity of infant seats, toddlers galore, ripe for the picking. The human exclamation points I was tailing didn't spare them a glance. He was focused only on escape, and yet... Why did he slow when a four-by-four four trundled across my path? There were seconds now, ample moments in which to disappear, but the car passed, and I located him in exactly the same position. I frowned. I'd seen a lot during my time in uniform, things that ought to have inured me to the sight of the Malinovsky kids in their wardrobe coffin, yet nothing of the typical predator profile fitted this guy. He kept looking back, nervous as hell yet somehow tethered to me. The fair was no more than a throbbing thumbprint in the sky by the time we reached the main road and took our odd little game into the commercial heart of this London commute about town. It was here, amid spruced up canals and gentrified warehouses, that a possibility occurred. Was this a trap? A strategy of Kerrigan's to pull me out of the safety of the ground? 
He comes to the fair and puts on a display, all mock menace, then introduces bait he knows will catch my eye. The nonce is the sacrificial lamb, coerced by Kerrigan into playing the lure. And if he takes a punch or two before the Knights of St. George arrive on the scene, well, the fascists claim they have no love for kiddie fiddlers. But all this presupposed a cunning that was alien to Kerrigan, a man who only got away with murder because the lead interviewer on his case had beaten the ever-living shit out of him. And anyway, he knew I needed no inducement. If he'd invited me to a meeting, I would have gladly attended. On now, we pass down a brightly painted quayside at an almost companionable saunter. The guy's shoulders relaxed a little. We were on home turf. Through a narrow alley, we came into a Disneyland version of a Dickens dockyard, its once polluted face scraped back to the bone. From old customs houses, international coffee shops doled out their wares to chattering pricks in business suits. Out of the dockyard, into another alley. But there could be no question about my having followed him now. He even shot me a gutsy little smile, the kind that would have made Jesus climb down from the cross and flip the human race the bird. At the door to a warehouse conversion, he stopped, his hand hovering over an entry keypad. Please come upstairs. We can talk properly in the flat. He glanced down at my fists, and for the first time since hearing Kerrigan's name, I flexed my fingers. I'll tell you what you need to know. You won't have to hurt me. He punched in a code, and the door clicked. Stepping inside, he wedged it open, then moved across the vestibule and summoned the lift. I accepted his invitation without question, and was soon riding the elevator to the fourth floor and accompanying him into his studio apartment. We didn't exchange a word until his knees came unhinged and he dropped lightly onto a cream-coloured sofa. The flat reeked of anonymity. I doubted it belonged to the very individual character who sat before me, a space that might once have housed a single gigantic loom had been compartmentalised with waist-level walls, the kind that could allow you to watch TV in bed while freely conversing with the love of your life as he took a shit next door. There was the usual exposed brickwork and cathedral-sized windows giving a stunning view of the blank wall opposite. Can I get you something to drink, Mr Jericho? He was sweating his powdered face giving way in minuscule avalanches. I think there might be mineral water in the fridge, or I could look for some wine, perhaps. I crossed the room and took him by the throat. Police are used to playing games. To play them with a reluctant witness used to be my forte, the gentle art of persuasion being one of those showman specialities. It was only when dealing with a particularly hostile suspect I knew to be guilty that my patience would wear thin. In those situations, Garris would usually take charge. Now, I was alone, faced with a puzzle that for the first time in two years piqued my interest, and a man who, if not yet a criminal, needed a good scare to stop him in his tracks. Carrying him to one of those big windows, I used my free hand to unsnib the latch and push open the pane. I popped him onto the lead-framed sill and, grasping his shirt front, tipped him gently backwards. I t t told you, he squealed. Y you don't need to hurt me. I'll tell. Speak slowly, I advised. No stammering. I have a headache, and Porky Pig was my least favourite loony tune. I will. He closed his eyes, made a supreme effort. Will, just pull me back. Let's see what you have to say first. I had my sleeve rolled up and he glanced at my straining bicep. He seemed repelled by the sight. I let him drop six inches and his bellow echoed in the canyon below. I know what you are, I told him. And believe me, I won't lose any sleep if your brains end up strawberrying the pavement. So take a breath and try not to shit yourself. Now... Why did you come to the fair this afternoon? It wasn't to scope out the kids, was it? At least that wasn't the main reason. You knew I was on to you. You wanted me to follow. So what the fuck is this all about? Do you think I'm like you? Is that it? 
thought we could have a nice little sit-down and trade fantasies. A curl of disgust rippled his upper lip, as if the very idea of sharing his daydreams was mortally offensive. You don't understand, d d do you? There's that stammer again, I clucked. You want to mess with me? I wouldn't advise it. Did you see the man I was talking with at the fair? The guy with the face that looks like it's had a serious disagreement with several staircases. Who do you think gave his skull a makeover? Tears welled. His chin piercing quivered. I no. The professor told me. Professor? I laughed. Are they handing out degrees in kiddie fiddling now? He gaped at me, as if I'd guessed some impossible truth. I shook him and the window rattled. If I wasn't careful, the whole thing could come loose from the moulded brickwork and I'd make good on my empty threats. Why did you wait for me? Who sent you? A hundred possibilities. It wasn't only Kerrigan I'd crossed in my years on the force. My arrest record was so formidable, some in CID had taken to calling me the fortune teller a funfair psychic who mystically foresaw the incriminating details of all his major takedowns. It was a joke laced with resentment. Garris aside, I hadn't made many friends on the job, and even my mentor had kept a certain distance. Then there were my thug-for-hire years, after I'd left the fair, but before Garris had drawn me over that thin blue line. In those best-forgotten days, I'd earned the undying enmity of a host of underworld maniacs. Had one of these finally tracked me down and set up the nonce as a lure? Again, it seemed an overly elaborate scheme. Who is this professor? I reeled him out another inch. What does he want? I don't know. I swear. His name's Campbell, okay? Professor Ralph Campbell. He contacted me through a friend, someone like me. Campbell rented his flat told me I could stay here a few days if I gave you a message. What message? And why didn't you just pass it on to me at the fair? It was a test, he panted. If you noticed me, saw me for what I was, then he'd be satisfied and matters could proceed. Those were his exact words. I've been hanging around for a week or so, but only saw you today. He'd sent you letters, he said, tried getting your attention that way at f first, but it didn't work. Of course not. Like Garris's case files, every scrap of mail I received was binned unread. Even those dreary letters from the inspector's wife, pestering me about my health and recommending nourishing recipes, were discarded. So, I shook him again. What's he after? You make him sound like a nonce. If he's in need of a beating, I'll RSVP right away and happily kick his teeth down his throat. Tell me the message and get it over with. He shut his eyes, like a character in a movie trying to recall a sequence of digits that'll defuse the bomb and save the city. In the end, it amounted to two simple words. When I heard them, I almost dropped him. The professor said to tell you that it's happening again, he said... The man looked at me, his expression puzzled, as if he too would dearly like to know the meaning behind his words. He said that they are dying again, all of them, that only you would be able to see the pattern and put things right. Tell Jericho, he said, that they're calling out to him, the dead of Traveller's Bridge. Chapter 4 Every showman knows the legend of Traveller's Bridge. There are variations, embellishments, but the version my mother told always had a ring of truth. I remembered her, the chiaroscura of her pale features thrown into relief by my bedside lamp, her palm pressing on the counterpane that covered my chest. And all at once, they are in the river, half a dozen, screaming and scratching and clawing for the sky, but not a one ever came out again, and the body of old, slip-jointed Jericho himself was never found. Now, hearing the tale referenced by a stranger, 
I experienced a jolt of mixed emotions. Anger first, rage that a piece of my childhood had been polluted by this pervert's lips. Hot on its heels came curiosity. How had Professor Campbell heard of such an obscure story? Then, that once familiar stirring I hadn't experienced since my final interview with Lenny Kerrigan. A puzzle had forced itself upon me, and, unlike the ones with which Garris had tried to intrigue me, this mystery wasn't a collection of abstract facts gathered into one of his files, but a living thing so far unexplored. Please, the nonce whimpered, don't let me fall. I'll do whatever you want. I hauled him over the ledge and threw him to the floor. There came a prim little snap, a finger, perhaps, but in the moment he didn't seem to notice. I dropped onto my haunches. What's your name? Don't lie, I'll know. He nodded, not a trace of guile left in him. Jeremy Worth. Jeremy. For the first time in a year, I took a moleskin notebook from the back pocket of my jeans and opened it to a fresh page. It was a habit I couldn't shake, keeping the book on me. In the old days, I'd maintained a scrupulous major investigation book for every case I worked. Disclosable to the defence, these logs were carefully penned with personal reflections unheard of. I decided then that this would be a very different kind of journal. Write down your name, address, phone number, email. Listen, he pleaded backing across the floor until his shoulders found the leather sofa. I don't need to be part of this. All I was asked to do was pass on a message. I don't even know who this professor is or what he wants with you. I'm not important. Oh, but you're wrong, Jeremy. You're very important. So important that one day a young friend of yours might scribble a note to his loved ones and then take himself to the edge of a tall building. Then I will feel very guilty for dragging you back from the brink and allowing him to fall. But that's not ever going to happen, is it? He shook his head, bubbles forming at the corners of his mouth as the pain of his broken finger finally pierced through the adrenaline. No, because you know I'm clever, don't you? Speak up. No stammering. Yes, he fizzed. Good. Now, I don't think you've acted on those impulses of yours. Not yet, anyway, but you're building up to it. What are you? Twenty-four? Twenty-five? That means you have some qualms. I squatted forward, fixed him with my eyes. Keep hold of those qualms, Jeremy. Nurture them every day, because from here on out, I'll be watching you. I don't want to hear that you've even glanced sideways at a primary school. Are we clear? Now, you might be thinking, how can one man possibly keep constant tabs on me? Well, first, I used to be a copper. And although they don't like me much anymore, I'll be passing on your details and asking them to keep an eye on you too. Second, you've just seen something of how my people work together. There are sections of us all over the country, Jeremy, and wherever you go, we'll be passing your door. Sooner or later. They have keen eyes too. So you know I'm speaking the truth when I say one slip, just one, and I'll hear about it. Then it won't be a matter for the police. Nod if you understand. Although for the most part what I told him was bullshit, he lapped it up like some awestruck disciple who just received a testament in stone. So... Write down what I asked. You're right-handed, aren't you? I glanced at his ballooning finger, already fat as an overcooked sausage. Use your left as best you can. Moaning, he held the page open with his elbow and made nursery letters with his undamaged hand. When he was done, I scooped up the book and slipped it back into my jeans. This professor got hold of you through a friend. I said. Does he know where I can find Campbell? You don't have to go through him, Jeremy panted against the pain. I have an address. Don't you get it? 
The professor wants you to find him. A paedophile dispatching a paedophile with a nonsensical message about an old fairground legend. It sounded like something that came into the incident room during the early days of an investigation, the fantastical theory of one of the usual hotline crazies. Did Jeremy Worth know more than he was telling? With a twist of that purpling finger, I might have double-checked, but instinct told me the well had run dry. Truth was, I'd already inflicted needless pain when a few questions and well-placed threats would have been enough. So why the brutality? Rebirth can be a violent process, I suppose. Tell me. Ralph Campbell, he muttered. Falls House, Clary Hugh Lane, Cambridge. You ever seen Campbell? No, I got a letter from him, but I lost it. He gave me the keys to the flat, a photo of you from the newspaper, and some money, that's all. He's probably just some fucking lunatic. Probably, I nodded, and turning away, headed to the door. Traveller's Bridge, he called after me. I got curious and looked it up online, took a bit of finding. But all that happened over a century ago, didn't it? So what can Campbell mean by saying they're dying again? We'll see, I said, my hand on the handle. I don't think it'll amount to much. But I didn't believe that. Not even then. Sal was waiting when I got back to the trailer. In the interim, she'd had access to the pit and had worked a minor miracle. Plates that looked like they had calcified around the time Vesuvius threw a fit gleamed in a dish rack I didn't know I possessed. Most of my clothes had been taken away, presumably for washing or incineration, and my books were arranged as neatly as possible beside my bed. The bed itself was stripped bare, the carpet hoovered, the window seals debugged. On the kitchen counter, my meds, mostly prescription, had been lined up like denouncers at a communist show trial. You didn't have to do this, I said, lurching up the step. I was already feeling woozy and wanted her gone. Those little pillboxes were calling to me. Hack to. She draped a soiled tea towel over the tap. Chernobyl wanted its record back as the world's most toxic shithole. Where have you been, Scott? Don't tell me you went after Kerrigan. No, it was something. I went and sat on the bed, fingertips trailing the spines of my books. Updike, George Eliot, Scott Fitzgerald, Hausman. Fleming, Conan Doyle. Old books, some of them my mother's, others stolen from a variety of libraries long, long ago. Sal, do you remember Traveller's Bridge? She frowned, and a glimpse of the red-headed tomboy who chased me under clotheslines strung between trailer doorways peeked out. She'd grown into a small, slim woman who carried the disappointment of her years in strands of grey and premature crow's feet, course. We used to scare ourselves silly with that old ghost story. It was just a story, though, wasn't it? Why are you asking about this now? Is it the fate? Don't start getting obsessed with conspiracies cooked up by old showmen, Scott. She lifted a hand to my forehead and brushed back a tangle of curls. You look better. Better than even a few hours ago. What's happened? I took her wrist and kissed the inside of her palm. What fate? Uncle Scott, look what I brung ya. Jodie tottered up the step, her arms laden with a fresh pile of shirts. I got to my feet and took the laundry from her. When I placed her gift carefully onto the bed, she jumped up and threw her arms around my neck. I laughed, a sound so rusty I think it frightened her. Dressed in a corn-coloured blouse and soap-scented dungarees, she was the exact replica of her mother at that age. A cheeky snub of a nose banded with freckles, brown eyes flecked with green sunset red hair. I'd never met her father. He was from a circuit up north, and, unlike most travelling men who, for good or ill, stick doggedly with the mother of their children, he'd abandoned Sal as soon as she'd shown him the positive test strip, 
At around that time, I'd been getting out from under a nasty bit of trouble. With mobsters on my back who made Al Capone look like Truman Capote, I hadn't thought it prudent to pay a visit to my pregnant best friend. At least, that's what I told myself. Unsettled by my laugh, Jodie sized me up with all the unflinching directness of her mother. Then she asked Sal's permission to go and play, and, with a flick of her braid, we were left alone. She's been imagining you for years, Sal smiled. All those stories I told her about us in the old days. She's built up this picture and... Reality's a fucker, eh? Not always. Make an effort. I nodded. Under the bed I found a pair of black ankle boots. After changing my red check shirt for a freshly laundered white one, I pulled them on. A light charcoal blazer, crumpled but fairly non-toxic, completed the finest wardrobe I'd worn since being sent down. I ducked my head to the mirror over the sink, grabbed a comb, and made the usual pointless effort to bring order to the briar. Then I tapped my pocket for the phone I hadn't charged in over a year. Sal, can you lend me your mobile? Just for today. She handed over the Nokia with all the startled acceptance of a bank teller filling a pillowcase. It was only when I took my car keys from the hook beside the door that she came to her senses. Scott, what are you doing? I paused on the step. My back turned to her. I have a case. Chapter 5 I had company on my trip to Cambridge. By the time the summer storm broke and the rain pummeled the road, the Malinovsky children were with me. Sonia, the eldest, in the passenger seat, Pietro and Tomasz leaning over the headrests. The motorway gleamed, eels slick, the wipers of my ancient Mercedes making feeble work of the deluge. I tried to ride out the hallucination, but my ghosts were insistent. The boys in the back flickered in the rearview mirror and made faces at me, tongues poking through fire-nibbled lips, thumbs waggling in the fleshless sockets of their ears. Then Sonia was scolding her brothers, and, like the good children they were, they rustled back into their seats. Never mind them, she said. They just don't understand, that's all. This time it seemed that my ghosts were in a talkative mood. I'd only heard Sonia's voice once before, on a recording of a school poetry recital played during my trial. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Despite her vocal cords being caked with smoke and seared to a crisp, she spoke now in the same warm, slightly accented tones that had echoed around the courtroom and made some of the jurors weep. Tap, 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 went the scalded hand on mine. I dared a sideways glance and saw a Halloween smile. The boys are much younger than me, Scott. They don't get that adults just keep making the same mistakes over and over. But it's good that you're going to try. The caravan was becoming very gloomy, and we're enjoying the road trip ever so much. Just don't promise things you can't deliver. You promised our dad that you'd put Mr. Kerrigan behind bars, and that didn't work out too well, did it? Behind me, in the fast lane, a lorry blared its horn and flashed its beams. I towed the brake and drifted across the carriageway, dropping to a pensionable thirty miles an hour. But when I looked again... The children were gone. I hadn't driven much since leaving jail, and the idea of a PTSD hallucination striking at a coasting speed of 70 hadn't occurred to me. I gripped the steering wheel hard. Back at the fair, Zack had given my jalopy a jump start from his swish little refurbed 67 Beetle, a present from the hated father, perhaps, while Sal assaulted me with a scattergun of questions. I'd kept my answers vague, I didn't want her involved in something I hadn't yet got a handle on. Zack, meanwhile, regarded her with marked jealousy, glances that did nothing for my ego and only made me feel sad for the kid. My turning flashed out of the semi-darkness, and I pulled the Merc into the loop of the exit. The car rumbled over a motorway bridge and plunged straight onto a B-road that was little better than a country lane. In the boot, 
A dozen or so of my mother's books crashed against each other while those cluttering the passenger footwell jounced like pioneers on a buckboard wagon. I peered through the rain as the sat-nav wittered in my ear. Five hundred yards to go. I slowed to a crawl, scanned the narrow road. Fields rolled out on either side, furrows melting under fists of rain. Suddenly, Fool's house appeared to rear up out of the landscape, like one of the mechanised skeletons in old Tommy Radlett's ghost train. Sweeping right, my headlights flooded down a gravel driveway and hit the yellow Ketton stone of the house. The car grumbled to a standstill as I parked up. The front portico had a crenellated roof and a gothic arch which sheltered the iron-banded oak door. A few green-mouthed gargoyles vomited rainwater from the eaves, while a coat of arms, robbed of its heraldic devices by the years, dripped forlornly over the entrance. The door swung smoothly inwards at my knock. A small, round-shouldered woman of about sixty, dressed almost entirely in black, stood on the threshold. As my eyes adjusted to the light in the hall, I saw that the left side of her face was badly burned. Like us, like us, phantom voices chattered in my head. Mr. Jericho, she said, the undamaged side of her face lifting into a generous smile. Please come in out of the rain. Thank you. Miss Barton, she nodded, as if I'd asked her name. We were hoping to see you a little sooner than this, you know. Sorry to disappoint. I'm afraid you have. I glanced around the hall. A high-vaulted, dark-panelled room with a long, uncarpeted staircase, it was a pederast's idea of heaven. Almost every scrap of wall was covered with canvases depicting the classical male form, doe-eyed, cupid-lipped, lightly muscled, and sporting tiny, hairless nubs between their legs. On plinths stood a half-dozen similar forms, this time in marble, their bodies stuck between the adult and the child. In a few pieces, a naked older male was depicted, his solicitous pose innocent enough to the ancient eye. In fact, they would all be relatively inoffensive if they'd been dotted around a gallery, but the sheer number and insistence of them made the room revolting. You know what he is, of course. Yes, you've met his messenger boy, so you must. Miss Barton fingered a small golden cross that lay against her chest. I get down on my knees and pray for him nightly. Any luck with that? Mercifully, yes. These days he's practically incapable. You don't sound like you approve of your employer, Miss Barton. Why do you stay? I was his nanny when he was a little boy. Old bonds, I suppose. And... Do you know what he wants with me? She smoothed the crucifix against her stiff white blouse. There isn't much that goes on in this house, I don't know. And with that, she led the way out of the hall and down a wide, wainscoted corridor. Having made his point, the professor didn't seem bothered about continuing his theme in the rest of the house. That, at least, was a mercy. We reached a door inlaid into the wall and Miss Barton knocked and turned the handle. Would you like something to drink, Mr. Jericho? she asked. No, I don't think so. Miss Barton nodded. I'll bring you a whiskey and soda. She gave me a final lopsided smile and pushed open the door. Just in case. Mr. Jericho, why have you kept me waiting, sir? I followed Miss Barton into the library, where she busied herself at a sideboard, returning seconds later with my drink. Then she inclined her head towards the fireplace and, skirt whispering across the plush purple carpet, left us alone. Aside from a portrait of a Georgian general that made Genghis Khan look friendly and approachable, this room was hardly decorated at all. By the light of the fire and a solitary standard lamp, I could read a few of the titles of the books which stood in the floor-to-ceiling shelves, the whole collection apparently concentrated on the mid-to-late Victorians. I ran my tongue over my teeth and turned to the man in the wheelchair. What can I do for you, Mr. Campbell?
seated beside the fire, a book face down on his blanketed lap, Campbell's startling blue eyes looked up at me. Professor, please, he said. Well, now, you can take that disapproving look off your face for a start. My crimes were discovered years ago, Mr. Jericho. I was drummed out of my profession, incarcerated, and now I have no impure urges at all. Lifting a thin arm, he smacked the heel of his hand against his groin. Chemical castration did wonders to drive out my demons. And yet, you still haven't got a single mature cock on your walls, I said. A pantomime of distaste played across his gaunt features. Forthright, I know that's the showman's way, except when the spiel demands otherwise. All that outside in the hall, he flicked a bird-like claw. Why, it's art, sir. You're not a Philistine, are you? I used to be a policeman, I shrugged. I'd call it grounds for interview. What a mercy, then, that you brought your career to such a stunning conclusion. Please. He inclined his body to one side, slippered feet swaying a little, and took out a mobile phone. Be my guest. I'm sure your former brethren would be delighted to hear from you, especially Inspector Garris. I looked at him. How do you know about me? Legends. Whispers. He tucked the phone away again. Then, of course, there's your family connection to the tragedy of Traveller's Bridge, a tale that has always been a particular favourite of mine. It's a wonderful coincidence, really, that you should have such a personal link to the matter in hand, as well as possessing the skills required to investigate the mystery. I sighed wearily. Tell me why I'm here, or we're done. He indicated the armchair opposite. We have much to discuss, and you're such a big fellow. Looking up at you gives me quite a crick in the neck. At last, curiosity overcame my revulsion, and I took a seat. Putting an age to Campbell was difficult. He might have been anywhere between his late thirties and late forties, his head was practically hairless, and his unnaturally smooth chin reminded me of those prepubescent paintings in the hall. Paradoxically, his cadaverous nurse could have both aged or preserved his features, for although his brilliant blue eyes shone in the shadows of his cheekbones, there didn't appear to be a single line in his waxy skin. Dressed more or less in black, like his housekeeper, the only hint of colour was the faintly violent shade of his lips. I wondered then whether rouging the master's mouth was one of Miss Barton's chores. You're here, said the professor, because I sent for you. Apologies, by the way, for little Jeremy. I had tried writing, but you seemed determined to ignore all communication from the outside world, and I simply had to get your attention. You have it, I twirled my finger. Can we move on? Certainly. But first, those red lips pouted, perhaps a little demonstration just to sate my curiosity. So many stories told to the private detectives I sent to investigate you. Former colleagues on the force, students from your brief stint at Oxford, your charming friends from that unsavoury period between university and joining the force. All agreed you were quite the detective, and so, anything? Indented palms along the line of the thumb. Deep, but not the ingrained callosity of a lifetime pushing a chair. Although I didn't want to please him, I'm a showman, and we like to perform. You weren't born disabled, I told him. What happened to you? He applauded. Prison happened to me. They used my screams to drown out the horror of their own sins. For those with a conscience, I believe it's how one survives such places. But then, you must know all about that. Anything else? I looked at him carefully. There was something amiss with his body language, a contradiction that seemed to constantly animate him. His upper torso would suddenly swell and thrust outwards, 
projecting his inert lower half in a way that clearly caused him discomfort. Then he would fall in on himself again, hunching over his lap as if cowed. He wanted to revel in being a victim and yet at the same time keep a part of it secret. It wasn't chemical castration, was it? I said. The people who broke your bones, they did the job properly, didn't they? His face went rigid. Anything else, Mr. Jericho? Just one thing. You weren't a professor of history. Why do you say so? The books. I glanced at the groaning shelves behind me. I know what a well-loved book looks like. Creases, dog ears, shabby spines. All those are brand new, so what's the game? So very close to perfection, but I'll have to award only an upper second, I'm afraid. I am, or was, a history professor. As for the books, you know what the police do to one's possessions during a search, especially those of a molester. After I came out of prison, I simply couldn't bear the thought of those big, rough hands on my treasures. And so I bought a fresh set and sent the old books to storage. One day I planned to get some young fellow or other to transcribe my annotations. What a shame. I thought you'd have done your research. He was right. I hadn't looked him up. It was a vice of mine which Garris had hated, an over-reliance on cleverness and instinct without the proper attention to detail. I could only shrug. So, I failed. Shall I go? By no means, Campbell smiled. After all, we have yet to discuss yesterday's murder. Chapter 6 Ever stood on the edge of a building and been tempted to take that final step into oblivion? Freud called it Thanatos, the death drive. It's that screw-the-risks instinct that makes chances of us all and probably accounts for the fact that the human race isn't still drawing stick figures on cave walls. I could feel something like it then, the near certainty that I was wading into lethal waters, yet still... I leaned forward and asked, What murder? Campbell smiled, his face more skull-like than ever. The third, of course, but we shall get to that. From under the open book on his lap, he produced a wireless clicker and thumbed a button. A huge image was suddenly projected onto the blank wall above the fireplace, a paparazzi shot of me and my old mentor, exiting the station after our second interview with Lenny Kerrigan. I knew the shots and the photographer well. After being assigned the Malinowski murders, Maxime Tiaro had hunted me throughout my bail period and afterwards lain in wait when Sal picked me up from HMP Hazelhurst a year later. She'd then hung around the fair for a week or two, catching the odd snap until, despite her fierce objections that my story wasn't over, some of the showmen had overheard her complaining on her mobile, her editor had pulled her from the gig. I studied the photograph with a detached kind of interest, as if the tightly wound young man towering above me were a stranger. Beside me, Garris looked his usual haggard self, although he retained the cool stare for which he was renowned. Dressed in his usual attire of pinstripe trousers, paisley tie and cream-coloured shirt with rolled-up sleeves, he looked like the kind of teacher that had died out a decade ago. The only thing that marked him out was the small tattoo on his left wrist, a single red poppy. It was a relic from his army days. Detective Constable Scott Jericho and D.I. Peter Garris, Campbell said in a scholarly tone. This is from almost two years ago, the last time they worked together. Despite a brilliant arrest record and swift promotion to CID, D.C. Jericho destroyed his career and almost derailed that of his friend by violently attacking the prime suspect in the murder of the Malinowski family. At his trial, colleagues described Mr. Jericho as intelligent, 
insightful, one of the best case closers in the business, but also temperamental and abrasive. His only close friend, if we may call him such, was D.I. Garris, who spoke as a character witness. He considered Jericho the most gifted detective he had ever worked with, possessing an almost unique investigative mind. The professor clicked again, and another Maxine Sierra shot appeared, this time a grainy picture of me leaving Hazelhurst. The private detectives in my employ gathered quite a few juicy titbits about your time inside. A red laser pointer played around my image's mouth, appearing to turn my lips a similar shade to those of Campbell's. Did you enjoy it, I wonder? I gave him a shrug. Were all your lectures this boring, Professor? I'm surprised the university waited for allegations of kiddie fiddling before firing you. His smile fell, and he clicked again. You're quite right. The recent past is unimportant, but it's my method to move from first principles, and I thought you might find my summary enlightening. Never mind. Onwards. Do you know what this is? I stared up at the new picture that had appeared on the wall. Are you telling me it's real? The professor chuckled. Oh, yes, indeed. The entire fable. A frozen river now bubbled above the fireplace, spanning it, an old bow-backed bridge. It was uncanny. With arches and pediments cobbled together from irregular cuts of Kentish stone, this was the bridge I had always pictured in my mother's bedtime story. Algae had crept up from the river and furred its legs in shades of green. Beyond, I could glimpse the calm meander of the water, caressed on all sides by heavy-headed willows. On the keystone was a plaque with a date that had been eaten away by the elements. Traveller's Bridge, I murmured. The second, Campbell corrected. The first had been medieval. This 19th century version is an exact replica, built to the order of Mr. Gideon Hillstrom, local landowner and mayor of the Oxfordshire town of Bradbury End. It was raised with the aid of public subscription, and much was made at the time of the generosity of the Bradburyans, with even the poorest widow donating a penny to the construction. The plaque reads... Erected in memory of those show people who died here when the old bridge collapsed in the great storm. Aclinus, falsis, animus, meliora, recusat. The mind, intent upon false appearances, refuses to admit better things. Very good, the professor nodded. From Horace, of course. I wonder what Mr. Hillstrom and his fellow dignitaries meant by that quote. I tapped my middle finger against my knee, wondering too. I still don't understand what all this has to do with a murder you say happened yesterday. You will. Now, apart from my studies in Victoriana, I have a small side interest in what one might call the various subcultures that existed at the time one of those being the traveller community. Of course, there had been such peoples for centuries, going right back to the wandering minstrels and jongler storytellers of the Dark Ages, but it wasn't until the 1800s that the travelling fair, as we know it, came into being. And one of its highlights was, of course, the freak show. I didn't like him talking about my people. I might have rejected them half a lifetime ago, but they'd taken me back without question in my time of need. The fact this repellent man seemed to know more about them than me was disconcerting. He clicked again and continued. Matthew Slip-Jointed Jericho The projection of the old daguerreotype glowed against the plaster. My ancestor had been a contortionist, that I knew, but spectacle shows like his had died out years ago, and I'd never seen one. Resplendent in a black top hat and tails, Matthew was standing on his left leg, his right wrapped around his back, a naked big toe scratching the inside of his ear. Meanwhile, his arms were cranked upwards behind him, 
palms inverted towards the floor, fingers twisted at angles that made me want to look away. Matthew Jericho was little more than bone, and apart from the jut of his jaw and a mess of black curls poking from under the brim of his hat, I couldn't see much resemblance to me or my father. Behind the showman stood a beautifully painted gaff card. Roll up, roll up, Jericho's freaks, novelties, curiosities, wonders of nature, human or otherwise, alive, dead or dying. There were others like him, Campbell went on. Tom Norman, the Silver King, exhibitor of the Elephant Man, was probably the best. A much maligned figure, as most of the freak show owners were. The truth was that many of these poor souls would have been sent to the workhouse or else starved in the streets, and most were as well paid as the showmen themselves. He was right about that, at least. The depiction of the traveller as a sadist who kept his unfortunate employees as beasts in a cage is, as far as I know, an old lie. Most were treated as friends and family, and many commanded good salaries or else sold their services to rival companies. It was a way to survive in a time when survival was a day-to-day -day battle. Matthew's show included some of the most spectacular acts of the day, Campbell went on, and sped through a series of slides. Gulliver Rice, the balloon-headed horror, another faded daguerreotype, this time of a man with some kind of tumorous malformation of the skull. His smile was kind, his single visible eye twinkling with good humour. Maria Landless, the electric lady, a pretty young woman with painted-on sparks rippling from her fingertips. A Marguerite de Belfort, the fat woman of Wimbledon. A lady who almost blotted out the bay window in which she sat, her vast chiffon dress barely accommodating the breasts that hung to her ankles. And finally, Charlie Buckley, the dog-faced boy. From his build, I guessed that this last was an adolescent of about fifteen. Apart from a few spare patches around the eyes and nose, coarse hair covered his entire face. I couldn't tell whether Charlie had been a genuine sufferer of hypertrichosis or werewolf syndrome, as it had once been known, or if he was duff, noun, a fairground fake, created by Matthew Jericho. It was these five, Campbell said, including your ancestor, who died when the old bridge collapsed in Bradbury's great storm. In the versions I've heard, they were coming into the town for the hop picking, I said. The fairs were doing badly at the time, and show people provided cheap labour for farmers in the harvest. That's right, the professor nodded. At that time, Jericho was travelling with Moody's fairground. Most of the showman loads had already made it to the far side of the bridge when Matthew's wagon, carrying him and the rest of the freaks, started to cross. By this point, the rain had been falling hard for five solid days and the swollen river had already burst its banks. Eyewitnesses described hearing a terrible groan that seemed to dwarf the thunder. Through a veil of rain... They watched as the Bradbury side pier gave way. The horse pulling the wagon shied, tipping its load onto the deck. Matthew was on his feet in an instant, grasping for the reins, when a hoof caught him across the brow and he dropped out of sight behind the parapet. The others rushed to help, but it was too late to save either Jericho or themselves. The bridge swayed drunkenly and seemed to turn ninety degrees, so that its southern head now faced the flow of the river. The watchers on the bank swear they saw this, although it seems physically impossible. Whatever the truth, the old bridge came apart in an explosion of bricks and dust. When the air cleared, the bodies were gone, some pinned fathoms deep by the debris, others washed downstream where they'd be found a few days later. Only the horse remained, flailing and wild-eyed in the torrent. He had told it almost as well as my mother. The only difference was that her version had contained an evolving roster of fictional players, whereas his described the real victims of the tragedy. Afterwards, the bridge was rebuilt, as I've described, he continued, and the locals took to calling it Traveller's Bridge. So tell me, detective... Did you find my story interesting? You've painted a vivid picture, I'll give you that, I said. 
that's only the beginning. He treated me to a death's head grin. Perhaps you should have that drink now, Mr. Jericho. Chapter 7 I don't drink. Oh, I think you will, he chuckled and clicked again. The picture of Charles Buckley, the dog-faced boy, was replaced with a crime scene photograph of a recently murdered monster. Unwittingly, I dropped my hand to the glass tumbler and took a deep gulp of bourbon. It stung my throat, settling me a little. But then I rose and, numb to the reach of the flames, stood in front of the fire. I stretched out my hand and touched the horror above. How did you get these? I have my sources, said Campbell. Any information has its price, but what do you make of it? That was a question I didn't want to answer, especially to this man who seemed somehow desperate not to be alone with his sin. But I'll tell you, my first reaction was excitement. Here, crucified upon the wall, was a human being who had once held within his now desecrated body all the hopes and terrors of any normal life. Yet in that instant, he was to me a corner piece in a puzzle, the dim outline of which I was only just beginning to realise. The fact he had been decapitated and that his head had been replaced might account for my detachment, I suppose. The victim looked unreal, like a fantastical figure plucked out of some dark fairy tale. Although the strange head that had taken the place of his own screamed for my attention, I forced myself to take in every other detail before the killer's showpiece overwhelmed the rest. The naked body appeared to have been lashed to the trunk of a tree, coarse rope secured around the legs and upper torso. His hands hung freely at his sides, and unless they had been untied later, my guess was that he died elsewhere and then been strung to the trunk. There were several ragged holes and a crusted bloom of blood over his heart, stains running under his armpits, which seemed to confirm that he had been killed while lying on his back. I stepped closer to the wall, still insensate to the flames. Yes, his fingers were clotted with fresh dirt, and I could imagine him gouging the earth in his short-lived agony. From the condition of the body, I guessed he had been in his late fifties, out of shape, with a pendulous beer belly that almost obscured his genitals, but strong with it. Those overdeveloped hand muscles belonged to a working man, while his knees were padded over with hardened skin. An idea occurred to me, and I turned to Campbell. Was this man a showman? No, he answered, but I'd be interested to hear why you think so. The physicality, I said, returning my gaze to the wall. Those callous knee joints, the slight slope and imbalance in his shoulder muscles, the strong calves... Travellers can get that way from continually sighting their caravans, pushing against the sides with their preferred shoulder, getting on all fours and guiding the hitch into the coupling. He was left-handed, anyway. Very good, the professor nodded. But no. In life, this poor soul was Robert McAllister from Anglesey, North Wales. He had no connection with fairgrounds, but he was the owner of the Sweet View Caravan site, that overlooks Benlec Bay, so your conclusions stand. Now that I had a name to personalise the victim, shame began to overwhelm my initial excitement. I moved on to the final detail. After death, McAllister's head had been removed with clinical savagery. I pictured it. A shark-toothed saw, clenched in a practice fist, the soft yielding of tissue as the edge began to bite, and then find purchase in the muscle below. A small whistle of air as it cleaved through the cartilage of the Adam's apple and entered the windpipe. Then, through secret ways, it plunged and, nipping the more or less drained jugular, released an undramatic dribble that barely stains the killer's hand. On then, through the carotid, into vocal chambers where music once played, and finally the scrape and turn of the saw as it found a smoother path between the barrier of the spine. A little jiggling and prizing, gripping McAllister's hair and working his waxen head this way and that, and the job is done. Except 
It isn't. Not quite. For the head must be replaced. Had he come prepared? I wondered. No. The dog's head looked fresh, its muzzle still iced with the foam of its terror. A collie, or Welsh sheepdog, ears and chops black, the centre of its face a flash of white that had probably run down to its belly. I couldn't tell how it had been killed, but hardly any of its blood seemed to have run down McAllister's body. There was no stitching that I could see, and the only other option the killer had to complete this modern freak show was to affix some kind of pole into the human torso and then work the dog's head onto its master's body, for I suddenly felt sure that this was McAllister's own pet. Campbell confirmed my suspicion. Right on both counts. That there is Bestie. Apparently the man was a football fan. A sharpened broom handle did the job, and poor Bestie's body and McAllister's head were found seated side by side in McAllister's somewhat cluttered caravan. A mercy, I suppose that the murderer didn't see fit to attach those parts, he tittered. Can you imagine? I breathed hard and took my seat again. Okay, so, apart from the obvious, what makes you think that this murder is connected to an accident that happened 150 years ago? Oh, why the others, of course? He clicked through two further images. Agatha Poole, 78, found that her villa in the Costa del Luth electrocuted in an old-fashioned tin bath. Strange, no? The photograph showed an old, white-haired woman squeezed into a tub barely larger than a wash bucket. Her head had been partially blackened, one arm incinerated to a stub, her naked body scorched and broiled red by the passage of electricity. Driven into the tips of her remaining fingers were what appeared to be thin strands of metal, slender as paper clips shiny and kinked as if to resemble forks of lightning. And here, Adya Mahal, a young girl of Indian heritage who died in the city of Lincoln five days after her 19th birthday. Again, the corpse was naked, this time sitting on a camp bed, sunlight through a red curtain dyeing her skin. In life, she had probably weighed around 25 stone, but in death... Parts of her had been cut away and forced down her throat. That sense of excitement, I felt, had swiftly curdled. Yet still, I leaned forward and asked Campbell to go back to the electric lady. He clicked, and the wall turned dark. I have prepared a file, and you may peruse all the photographs at your leisure. All right. I swilled the last of the bourbon. So, we have three murders with ritualistic hallmarks, but no common pattern. The methods of killing, of displaying the bodies, there's no consistent M.O. Correct, Campbell agreed. But there are one or two connections between the killings. First, the staging of the bodies is suggestive of those who died on Traveller's Bridge. He counted them off on his fingers. The dog-faced boy, the electric lady, and the fat woman of Wimbledon. Only two more to go, Mr. Jericho. The balloon-headed horror, and your ancestor, the contortionist, slip-jointed Jericho. And then there's this. He reached for a nearby table and handed me three enlargements. Found on McAllister's forehead, the sole of Agatha Poole's left foot, and under a flap of Adia Mahal's skin. Carved into the dead flesh of each were individual letters. A. F. A. Aclinus. Falsis. Animus the first three initial letters from the Traveller's Bridge Memorial quotation. They are dying again, Mr. Jericho, Campbell smiled. One by one. Chapter 8 How did you piece this together? I asked. Inherited wealth and, since my eunuchizing... A staggering amount of free time. Campbell wheeled himself away from the fire and moved to a large desk that stood against a heavily draped window. There he busied himself with papers. I have a little holiday home on Red Wharf Bay, just around the coast from Benlech. I was up there a few days after McAllister's murder and I happened to catch sight of it in one of the national papers. 
He looked back at me with something like amusement in his gaze. You really haven't heard of any of these cases, have you? All I could do was shake my head. The truth was I hadn't picked up a paper since my arrest, hadn't watched the TV news or even glanced at the internet. Now, as Campbell touched the wireless switch again, the wall came alive with a blaze of sensational headlines. Police baffled by head swap psycho. Could bizarre Spanish death be linked to Welsh murder? Sick serial killer leaves no clues. My, how you buried yourself away, Mr. Jericho, Campbell smiled. The first two murders were all over the press for a month or two, though the initial furore has died down somewhat. Tentative links were drawn by both the UK and Spanish police and the media. The outlandishness of the crimes was, of course, indicative, but otherwise they have been at a loss to connect the killings, and, as is so often the case with the press and the public, bafflement soon turned to frustration, and frustration to indifference. But not for you. The police held back a lot of detail, but what I heard struck a chord, he nodded. The whole thing had the flavour of something incomplete. And so, my interest piqued, I hired a couple of private detectives, the same ones who compiled the report on you, and set them to work. So, McAllister was the first, I asked. January 18th, then poor Miss Poole on the 3rd of March, and finally, Aldia Mahal, only yesterday. My little investigative elves are very quick, aren't they? What else have they discovered? Only one other intriguing detail. It went overlooked by the Welsh police, but one of my sleuths discovered it in a paparazzi shot taken at McAllister's caravan the day the murder was discovered. Here, take a look. Tell me what you see. That thin claw reached out again and passed me yet another enlargement, this time of a dirty trailer window. A small, featureless figure was balanced against the glass, its limbs contorted into strange and unlikely angles. I recognised it as one of those little wooden mannequins with articulated joints that artists use for reference when drawing the human form. The tortured pose of the figure was suggestive enough, but the clincher was the miniature outfit it had been dressed in. Resplendent in top hat and tails, this was almost certainly meant to represent Matthew slip-jointed Jericho himself. Were figures left at each crime scene? I asked, my mouth horribly dry. Only at the first, Campbell told me. A calling card, if you will, from our killer. A signal that he had commenced his dreadful task. McAllister's caravan was stuffed with bric-a-brac left behind by visitors to the campsite. And so this wee fellow was easily overlooked by the police. But my detectives have established from friends and neighbours that the mannequin had never been seen before the day of the murder. Campbell added a final page and waved the complete file in the air. Anyway, it's all here, what little there is. I frowned at the slim contents. But surely the police must be drowning in information. The British lot and the Spanish force... You'd think so, wouldn't you? But aside from the bizarre nature of the crimes, there was no significant forensic evidence left at the scenes. Indeed, I am the first to have solidly connected the murders. The victims have absolutely no relationship to each other, and, as you say, there is no discernible pattern to the ritualism other than that which our special knowledge tells. Without the key of Traveller's Bridge, the police are clueless. I think we should inform them, I said, a trace of reluctance in my voice. And do you think they'd believe such an incredible theory coming from the likes of me, or from you? Pardon the pun, but haven't you burned those bridges? He had a point. Only the flimsiest and most extraordinary thread linked these murders. That I was now convinced of its reality wouldn't do much to sway my former colleagues, but perhaps one of them might listen. Campbell coasted over to where I now stood, my back resting against his bookcase. Your file. I hesitated. Firelights danced across the manila surface, and I felt again the spectral touch of a tiny hand in mine. I will pay you, 
the professor tweeted, a hint of panic in his tone. Name your fee. Five hundred a day, plus expenses. A bonus, of course, once the case is solved. I don't even ask for proofs that will stand up in court, just a name and a reason. I needed money. My resources were dwindling fast, and, aside from a place to rest my head, I hadn't asked my father for a handout since I was eighteen. Anyway, the case had already got its hooks into me. Not only the strangeness of the mystery itself, but, if I was honest, the air of violence and danger that hung around it. Thanatos again. Taking out my logbook, I tore off a sheet, printed my bank details, and handed it to Campbell. He grabbed the scrap of paper like a starving urchin snatching at a heel of bread. I leave the course of the investigation to you, he said. I only ask that you make the occasional report whenever you can manage. All the urgency of a moment ago had vanished. It seemed odd, but I could have sworn that, having handed over the case, he was now utterly uninterested in it. So, I said, the file clutched to my chest. What do you get out of all this? His gaze flickered to the well of his lap. What remains for a man when he has no passion left? Curiosity, I suppose. A dangerous thing in the wrong hands. I shook my head. I didn't buy it. Not completely. Superficially, his fixation on the case might be just what it appeared. The gruesome hobby of a man of means whose days were otherwise empty. But there was also the somewhat sinister character of Campbell himself that suggested any morbid topic could easily tip over into obsession. Yet, for some reason I couldn't quite put my finger on, his explanation rang false. Nevertheless, he had woken me from the constant horror of the Malinovsky case, and the scent he had started me on was solid enough. Whatever Campbell's true motive for wanting the case investigated, a murderer was at large, and at least two more people were in danger. Without saying goodbye, I closed the door behind me and headed back down the corridor, where I found Miss Barton waiting in the hall's pederast gallery. Her burned face hitched into a half-smile so melancholy B.B. King could have used her as a muse. All done? she asked. Not nearly. What do you think of it all? She went to the door and opened it onto a landscape that steamed in the aftershock of the storm. The air was thick with the deep brown odour of the earth and the stagnancy of things unburied. A distant flash of lightning lit up a faraway hillside, and I thought of dog-headed men dripping in the rain, electric ladies murdered by the heavens, a girl choked with the clods of her own flesh. I'll pray for you, Mr. Jericho, Miss Barton promised. Go well with your God. I reached into the passenger seat and touched the case file, reassuring myself that all I had seen and heard was real. It seemed incredible, like something cooked up between Stephen King and the Marquis de Sade. Crawling at fifty along the empty bow of the M11, I wondered, who? I didn't need a name or even a profile at this stage, just the vaguest hint. The character of the crimes, the deliberate staging of the victims to echo those drowned at Traveller's Bridge, the initials from the memorial, the placing of the Jericho mannequin at the first scene, all were prima facie evidence of a link and therefore of someone familiar with the story. A showman? I didn't like the idea, but it was possible. The story had so many versions, bowderized for younger listeners, transformed into almost Jacobean revenge tragedies for older ears, that a few of the old-timers on the circuit must have heard the original. And this wasn't the work of some eighty-year-old aunt, however, but might her bedtime tale have inspired a grown-up grandson to murder. We like to think we're different, but, just like the rest of society, Travellers have their quota of psychopaths. There were other possibilities. Someone from Bradbury End, maybe. Locals might well be familiar with the legend of the drowned freaks. It could even be taught in their primary school, the distance of years making it no more than a ghoulish tidbit of town law. In that case, the cast of potential suspects could be vast, and I had none of my old police resources to fall back on. Where once I might have enjoyed unfettered access to forensic and coroner reports, 
the home's computer system for cross-checking and managing serial killer cases, and the natural authority that comes with the badge, I now had to rely solely on Campbell's file. Still, perhaps working a case informally might have its benefits. I knew from how the press photographer Maxine Tierra had tracked me down that the public is often more likely to provide information if they know their name will never appear in any official document. Plus, I no longer needed to justify the loose hunches that had more than once got me into trouble. Now I could simply follow my nose. Aside from the good folk of Bradbury End, I was hunting in the dark. It could easily be a lone lunatic who, like the professor, had taken an unhealthy interest in fairground history. A thought occurred, and I allowed it space to breathe. I already had the feeling that Campbell was holding something back regarding his interest in the case, but was it possible that he had some direct hand in it? He couldn't have murdered them himself, of course, but what if he had convinced someone else... For a moment, I entertained the absurd image of Miss Barton spearing Bestie's head onto Robert McAllister's corpse. Two more murders to go, if Campbell's theory held. Why these victims? I'd have to review the file, check that the professor's hired gumshoes hadn't missed anything, but my instinct agreed with their conclusions. These people had no connection. Not business, family, friends only the fact that they'd been remade into a grisly pantomime of the Jericho freaks. A service station sparked against the darkness. In response, my stomach growled. I hadn't eaten all day and I was suddenly famished. Under the glare of the forecourt, I topped up my tank and went in search of a sandwich. It didn't occur to me then that, for the first time in months, the smell of petrol hadn't inspired a visitation from my ghosts. BLT in hand... I waited at the till where an exhausted-looking businessman was swiping his debit card. Bored, I glanced over towards my car, only to find a familiar figure leaning against the passenger door. Lenny Kerrigan grinned and waved. Sir, muttered the attendant, I can serve you now. What? I turned as the businessman shouldered his way past. Sorry, I need to... Look... I thrust four twenties onto the counter. I have to go. Keep the change. But, sir... Anne Boleyn had probably skipped her way to the block with more alacrity than the businessman possessed as he progressed to the exit. Returning the compliment of his shoulder, I elbowed him out of the way, ignoring a cattish shriek as his coffee splashed his hand. Outside, a gust of exhaust fumes hit me. Kerrigan was nowhere to be seen. I ran across the forecourt, jugged a circuit around the station, came back checked my doors, and even under the car. He might possibly have slipped away in his own car, or else... Fucking lunatic! The businessman called from the window of his Subaru. Could I have imagined him? I slammed my palm against the bonnet. Of course I could. Nothing more likely. Throwing the unopened sandwich onto the back seat, I pulled into the shadows of the overnight truck stop. There I took out Sal's phone and dialed the one number I still had memorised. No one picked up on the first or second attempt. By the glow of the dashboard, I saw that it was a quarter to one, but then he'd always kept erratic hours, especially when Harriet hadn't been well. I was about to give up when a drowsy voice answered. Hell is it? Unless you're being fucking murdered, I'm not... Sir. I rested the side of my head against the window. Pete? It's me. There was a pause during which I wondered if he'd hung up. In the five years I'd known him, I had never been to his house, never met the sickly wife who wrote me letters as if she were a doting aunt. Garris was an intensely private man, sensitive of his wife's needs, but I could imagine him now sitting in a cheery kitchen, Harriet's amateurish watercolours adorning the walls. I'd received a few of these as presents over the years, Garris handing them to me, a mix of pride and embarrassment contorting his usually neutral features. He was often cool, even with his protégé, and yet I never once doubted his love for his wife, nor ever summoned the courage to ask what was wrong with her. Just a moment. A door clicked shut, and he was back. Is this about the files? He asked without preamble. I brought you a fresh batch the other day. I'm not sure you even knew I was there, but... 
He paused, as if remembering some vital fact. How are you, Scott? I'm good. He sniffed at that, sharp as ever. I'm better. How's Harriet? Not well. In all our time together, this was one of the rare moments when I heard weakness in his voice. Worse, if anything. Sir, if there's... What could you possibly do? He cut in. And enough with that sir stuff. You're never coming back, Scott, so drop the formalities. Is it about the files? They'll hang me if they find out I've been printing off cases, probably cut my bollocks off too if they discover I've been bringing them to you. But, honestly, we could do with some help. There's a case I have running at the moment, the murder of a nurse in Cold Arbor Lane. Pete, I need a favour. Another pause. Another sigh. I could see him, hunched over the kitchen table, phone cradled to his ear. This is going to cost me my balls, isn't it? Never mind, he muttered, when I tried a half-hearted reassurance. You did me enough favours back in the day. Go on, shoot. Can you look into a guy called Campbell for me? Professor Ralph Campbell. He used to be a lecturer in history, jailed after some kind of kiddie case. I just want a background check. I could hear Garris scribbling, then the familiar cluck of his tongue against the roof of his mouth. Is this a case, Scott? Something we ought to know about? I should tell him. At least two more lives were at stake. But Campbell was right. Even if Garris bought such a wild story, he was still serving under a cloud for his connection with me. I couldn't risk his career a second time. I'm not sure yet. I'll let you know. OK, he yawned. I'll try to have something for you by close of play tomorrow, if not a little earlier. Anything else I can help you with? No? Then please, any more favours you want to call in, can we keep the request to a more sociable hour? Listen, I heard a drum of fingers. I'm glad you're feeling better. Keep it up. The phone went dead, and I dropped it onto the passenger seat. There, something snared my eye. The corner of a cherry-tinted piece of paper poking out from Campbell's file. I knew that shade well. It was the distinctive branding chosen by my father to market Jericho fares. Pulling it free, I saw that it was a handbill, the kind the chaps distributed across any new town we rolled into. The text was typically ornate, summoning nostalgia for the old fares Matthew Jericho might once have known. As this thought flitted into my mind, I read the words and felt a pleasing horror prickle the nape of my neck. Coming soon to Bradbury End, the return of Jericho Fair, in commemoration of the 150th anniversary of the tragedy of Traveller's Bridge, Aclinus Falsis Animus Meliora Recusat. Chapter 9 I parked up and strode through the 3 a.m. stillness. Alert to their duty... The fairground jooks strained at their leads and sniffed my heels in a way that would send a stranger's balls squirrelling for cover. Among them, John Webster gave a welcome grunt. I scratched a tattered ear. My mother had bought him in the last year of her life and, because of his love of ripping rats to pieces and leaving them as offerings on the trailer step, had named the boxer dog after her favourite bloodthirsty playwright. Hey boy, old man still up? He looked at me, brow raised, quizzical as a barrister. At Dad's trailer, I took out the crumpled handbill again. Sal had said something about a fate when I'd mentioned Traveller's Bridge. Something else, too, which I couldn't bring to mind. As I was living on the fair, Campbell must have assumed I knew about the anniversary event, and so I hadn't thought it worth mentioning. But what did it mean? That the murders had been inspired by this year's commemoration or that the killer had waited perhaps decades before setting his plan in motion. Surely even the most cool-headed psychopath would find that kind of restraint almost impossible. Unless, of course, he had killed before, 
and had changed his modus operandi after reading about the Traveller's Bridge tragedy. I stuffed the bill into my pocket and tapped my father's door. He had a good-sized chalet at the yard in Kent where he wintered, but for travelling he kept his simple Colchester, a model pushing forty on whose now threadbare sofa I had been born. Much less grand than the big Sipsons and Baileys owned by other well-to-do travellers, Dad kept the Colchester because it was, in his words, a showman's trailer, not some Joskin's place on wheels. In, if you're coming, he barked. The Chester was in semi-darkness, a single lamp burning on a side table at the end of the locker settee. Unlike most of her generation, my mother had taken the plastic covers off her sofa on the promise Dad would never sit there in his overalls. Now, dressed in immaculate day clothes, he muted the TV and held out his hand. The gesture caught me off guard. Grasping my wrist, he turned my hand palm up. Been to Cambridge? I shook my head. How? Time you've been gone, and the word right there. I looked at the faded imprint on my hand. Ear Chang, and understood. My hands were often closed into fists, and the receipt had sweated its impression. Bert Changer, services. Got fuel on the way back, must have. Why not on the way there? It's still just about readable. He nodded at the chair opposite. From my mother, I'd inherited my strong features. From my father, Black curls and a broad-shouldered body that dwarfed the armchair. Truth be told, my dad had a face only a mother could love, and I'm not entirely sure my own mother had loved him all that much. It had started, so the aunts told me, with a whirlwind romance, a pull of opposites, swiftly followed by a long, bitter trench of reality. I often wonder what might have become of them if I'd never been born. Divorce, I guess. So, you found trouble? said Dad, leaning forward, spade-like hands between his knees. All trouble found you? You reckon? He got up and lumbered to the kitchen area, poured a glass of milk and returned. For a moment, I wondered if he was going to hand it to me, a bedtime drink for his boy. Sitting again, he cradled it to his chest. You're talking to me? He took a long gulp and cuffed the white from his salt-and-pepper moustache. That old gallery yawn has been over quite a lot. Not a bad old Joskin, all told. Had him up here for a brew, once or twice. He left you a bit of work yesterday, asked after you. So, is this his business, or have I got that Nazi fucker to thank for you being up and about? It's nothing to do with Kerrigan, I assured him. It's a case I've taken on, private client. As the posh. Not bad. Enough to dent my overdraft, maybe? I told you, I can sort that right now. No. My father's weathered face corrugated. And I don't need any help with Lenny Kerrigan, if you were thinking of going after him. I'm not that stupid, he grunted. But sometimes, my feelings do get the better of me. Say, I hear of a gorger who comes roaring onto my ground, disturbing the peace. He spread his hands. What am I to do? Now, I know a thing or two about this one, and even if I didn't, that snide little swastika tattoo tells me everything worth knowing. What I have, right here, is a bit of filth who'd be better off in his box forty years ahead of time. I'm not saying I'd go that far, maybe not even as far as my boy saw fit. And here the mask fractured for an instant. Was it pride? If it was, I didn't want it. But we have ways of calming such a rabid animal right down. One of the first books I ever stole from a library was a children's history of the great Romans. I remember sitting on my narrow bed, reading by the light of the fair the faces of long-dead philosophers and dictators strobing before my eyes. I knew then that my old man had the tongue of Cicero and the guts of Caesar, and I'd loved him for it. That was ten years before I became his Brutus, betraying him in the only way he could never really forgive, by leaving the life. Stay away from Kerrigan, I said. I can deal with him. He nodded. That much is clear. I fished in my jeans and took out the handbill. 
I want to know about this. Had those sent out weeks back, he said. Why the sudden interest? You want to run a ride there? I can get you a cushy little set of jets that'd rake it in at a special event like Bradbury End. No, it's not that. Then what? It's the case. It might have something to do with this, the town. I tapped a finger against the bill. I'm not sure how. Not yet, but there's a connection. He gave me an appraising look, the kind of Cicero glance that could size up a punter at 50 yards and calculate his net worth to the nearest grand. Something dangerous. If there's a threat to us in Oxfordshire, I want to know ahead of time. It's nothing like that, I said. I wondered at the lie. Right then I could feel the tail spinner inside me, the liar who had tried to win friends at a dozen different schools by inventing humdrum backgrounds. Anything to stop the name calling before it started. Pikey. Jippo. Now I let it convince me that I was telling the truth. A random assortment of people had died. There was no threat to the travellers. You don't have to worry. A beat. A lone dog barked, and Webster answered like a sergeant major demanding order in the ranks. Can't ever play it straight, can you? Just like your mother. Leave it out, he said when I stirred. She was my wife, and I can speak as I like. So what do you want to know? How was the booking arranged? We were contacted about a year ago by the governors up that way. Blokes called Carmody and Heelstrom. Far as I can tell... Carmody's the errand boy and chief liquor of Hillstrom's fat ass. They approached us asking if we'd consider bringing the show back to Bradbury. You're looking pale, what's up? Hillstrom? Gideon? Hillstrom? A superstitious dread washed over me. In that moment, with the trailer painted dusky by lamplight, it seemed almost credible that the same Victorian bridge builder and mayor of Bradbury End had somehow reached across the centuries and set us all to dance. Wasn't this a ghost story, after all? Serial murderers with a fetish for symbolism are usually a sorry lot, barely more sophisticated than a pimply goth with a hard-on for true crime and death metal. Yet this case had a care about it that made the whole thing hardly seem real. Dad reached for his coat flipped out his wallet and handed over a gilded business card. First name's Marcus, not Gideon. Marcus Hillstrom, OBE, leader of Bradbury End Town Council. First class div, I reckon. I thumbed the overly embossed honorific and thought my dad was probably right. So, what's the story? Why the fate, you mean? Probably just a gimmick to give the local economy a boost. Nothing draws them like a fair. He razzle-dazzled his hands. His moustache stretched over the hump of a piss-taking smile. Truth was, the whole business had been living on borrowed time for decades. In a world of on-demand thrills streamed straight into your lap, how could the rickety charm of a travelling fair compete? We agreed on a flat fee for the whole thing, he continued. Three round-the-clock rides for the punters. Special events are where the posh is now. You take sweet Fanny Adams with a pay-by-the-ride fare these days. Must have cost them a bit, I said. Local businesses will pitch in, I suppose. The same respectable kinds that would have run us out of town once upon a time. Does that mean we're respectable? I half-smiled. We're tamed, is what we are. They've got a new bogeyman, I hate now. Asylum seekers, starving immigrants trying to earn a crust. He stretched out his long legs, hip bones cracking. Anyhow, Hildstrom said they wanted to mark the anniversary and that his lackey Carmody had found us online. Said the tragedy had become something of a legend up Bradbury Way. Not that all of them want us there. What do you mean? Some vote in the council. Dad sniffed. A few of the bigwigs were against it. Thought it was maudlin to look back when the town could be spending money on new projects. Must say, I agree with that. Dwelling on the past never did anyone much good. He shot me a pointed glance. 
I returned it as levelly as I could and watched it swaying without defeat to the framed photograph of my mother that hung above the three-bar fire. Anyway, he looked up, can't see how this is any business of yours. Nor can I, I said, getting to my feet. Not yet. Look, I'll be heading off to Bradbury End in the morning. Can I take the trailer? His nose wrinkled. That old Eccles. I can buy any further than that ship box will take you. Let me make a few calls and I'll set you up with a brand new... The Eccles will be fine, I said, hand on the door. And I promise I'll tell you if things get messy. No trouble will come to the ground if I can help it. I was almost out of the trailer when he muttered after me, You give that boy Zack a few quid when you're done with him. He's not a bad lad. I stiffened. And he's not a whore. I didn't say he was. His words ghosted with me down the steps. Webster snuffled my palm, whimpered as I left him behind. I padded over mussed-up grass and rain-drenched duckboards, saw a light flicker behind a blind, heard game-show applause from the TV of an insomniac aunt. Any one of these people would open their home to me right here and now, loan me their life savings if I asked. I glanced down avenues of trailers, laid out with the mathematical precision of master travellers, I wondered what horrors I might soon bring to their door. Chapter 10 My hand trembled and scalding coffee splashed across the dead woman stuffed into the makeshift bathtub. The sagging, incinerated sockets of Agatha Poole's eyes stared back at me, almost reproachfully from the photograph. Glancing around the roadside diner, I snatched some paper napkins from a dispenser and blotted away the spill. I took a breath, concentrated on my heartbeats, felt them settle. Then I sorted the crime scene shots back into their manila file. I knew why my hands were so unsteady, why the back of my neck was sticky and damp, why my right leg pistoned under the table like a pneumatic drill. It had nothing to do with the macabre details I'd been poring over for the twentieth time that morning, in fact, there was something emotionally distancing about the gothic imagery of these staged murders. The dog-headed McAllister, the electrically cremated Agatha, the self-cannibalised Adya Mahal. A sense that they were somehow unreal, like waxworks in a chamber of horrors. No, it was the withdrawal symptoms that ate my nerves. For the first time in almost two years, I had slept well. No need to seek out meaningless sex to exhaust myself. No need to double down on my Zopiclone prescription. In dreams, I had turned over the puzzle I'd been set by Campbell and found myself waking at dawn, relaxed and eager to begin. It had taken the violent and senseless deaths of three innocent people to give me this respite from my demons. Make of that what you will. But although my mind had hit a kind of reset... My body still craved the daily dose of meds that had held it together for so long. I knew it was dangerous, not to say distracting, to go cold turkey, but I also knew that I couldn't afford a brain fogged by sleeping pills and benzos. Two more lives were at stake, and if I had a hope of saving them, I needed to stay sharp. I'd just have to ride out the next few days as best I could. That meant ignoring my ghosts, too. Sitting back in the red leather of the booth, I caught sight of plump legs kicking against the backboard. Blackened morsels flaked away from their shoes and fell like dark snow upon the sticky linoleum. I didn't look across the table. I laid my palms flat on the case file and closed my eyes against Sonia's words. How funny that you think you can save anyone, she said, her voice sorrowful rather than unkind. Oh, Scott... You can't even save yourself. I let them whisper and laugh and fade away. More coffee, love? I blinked up at the waitress, a busty grandmother in a peppermint uniform that clashed horribly with the red, white and blue hokiness of the American-themed diner. She freshened my cup and sashayed away, a theatrical wink for all and varicose veins that went on for days. Back to the case file. I took out my notebook and started scribbling. 
The top hat and tails on the Jericho mannequin looked homemade, probably pieced together from scraps of cardboard and bits of felt. The killer, possibly avoiding the use of a branded doll's outfit, in case characteristic details or an order history could be chased back to him. Scorch marks on the rim of the tin tub in which Agatha had been transformed into a crude caricature of Maria Landless, the electric lady. Burn points at which frayed wires rather than the teeth of electrode clamps had been attached. Other small details in the photos and reports. Clean edges to the flesh stuffed into Adya's mouth, indicating a non-serrated blade. No autopsy report yet on Adya, this time remade as Marguerite de Belfort, the fat woman of Wimbledon. But from the amount of blood in her mouth, she must have been alive while her flesh was fed to her. Only lightly bound, so some sedative was probably administered. All of this, the care, the preparation, tallied with something else suggestive in the police reports. No forensic evidence. Not a hair, not a fingerprint, not a scrap of the killer's DNA to be found at any of the three locations. Did this mean a seasoned predator was at work? I felt it in my bones. Despite the savagery of the crimes, a clinical calmness shone through, as if the deaths were not an end in themselves, but sketches working towards a larger design. Even with these incomplete flourishes, however, I already believed I had a feeling for the mind working behind them. He had come to his victims with a clear purpose, and he had achieved exactly what he intended. No more, no less. But if this wasn't his first rodeo, then what might it suggest about his previous crimes? The recreation of the Jericho freaks was a fixed idea. It had five potential victims and set conditions in which he had to operate. The pattern would always be dictated by the historical tragedy. I know it might sound ludicrous to talk about a psychopath in such terms, but my experience of these monsters told me I was right. Once established, serial killers follow their rituals obsessively, even to the point where it might endanger them. One of my cases had involved a child murderer who always left a particular brand of baby's blanket clasped in his victim's fist. He must have known we would eventually track him through the purchase of the item, but for him, the compulsion had outweighed any sense of self-preservation. Could we then say this killer had a thing for restaging historical tragedies? Was that his overriding M.O.? If so, he had not yet been detected, and finding him through a deep dive into unsolved cases would be both time-consuming and difficult, especially as I had no access to police databases. I sighed and took a swig of coffee. So many alleyways to explore, so many potential cul-de-sacs to get lost down. Once I could have aired my theories with Garris, got his no-nonsense take on my fantastical hunches. I allowed myself a half-smile, thinking back to all those post-shift beers in the Three Crowns, where we'd pour over current cases before lapsing into more general chatter. One thing I know my mentor would have come back to was the connection, or lack thereof, between the victims. They must be connected, or else why did the killer not simply target random people in Bradbury End? That was the natural locus of the crimes, after all. Unless he didn't want the murders to be connected too early. That might suggest he had a link to the victims that could expose him. But something about this idea didn't sit right. There was a connection between McAllister, Poole and Mahal, something impersonal but significant that I was missing. I sensed it like a word dancing on the tip of my tongue, and strangely enough, I felt that the link had already been made. Not by me or Campbell, but in something someone had said to me recently. I gave it up. I could chase the idea around for hours and get nowhere. Best to wait and let it come to me. My phone pinged. A text from Zack. Sal told me you've gone on ahead to Bradbury. Thanks for saying goodbye. You're a fucking asshole, Scott. And you're a good judge of character, Zack, I murmured. Truth be told, I had deliberately avoided him this morning. He was a good kid, as my dad had said, and deserved a lot better than some washed-up thirty-something with anger management issues and delusions of being haunted. If I gave him a couple of days, he'd come to his senses. And so I'd washed and dressed early, 
before even the jooks had stirred, and crossing the dew-dappled fairground had stopped only to drop Sal's phone back to her. She'd opened the door to her trailer, bedheaded and blurry-eyed. Scott, Jesus, what time is it? I knew she'd have been up past midnight, minding her candy floss stall. By way of apology, I handed her a steaming cup of tea. Thanks for the loan, I said, slipping the phone into her dressing gown pocket. I've got mine charged up again. I'm heading off to Bradbury End early, so I guess I'll see you there. Wait, what? You going where? She shook her head, tumbles of red hair burnished by the dawn. Scott, what's going on? Last night you were tearing off somewhere talking about a case and now you're heading to the next fair days ahead of schedule. She beamed. Have you worked out something with your dad? Are you running a ride there? Oh, God, it'll be just like the old days. We can sit up next to each other, make fun of the Joskins. I laid a hand on her arm. It's not that. I do have a case and somehow it's connected to Bradbury End. She frowned. Wow, that's quite a coincidence, isn't it? She must have caught something in my tone. Just what is this? You're up and about at a crack of dawn, washed and dressed, looking vaguely human. I laughed. You make it sound like a bad thing. Is it? Look, of course I'm happy to see you like this, Christ... If you told me yesterday that I'd have some version of the old Scott back, I'd have danced around the fucking maypole. But I know this look. She brushed back a tangle of curls from my forehead. Whatever you've got yourself involved with, it's dangerous. I can see it in your face, the buzz, the thrill. I closed my eyes. Honestly, Sal, I don't know what you want from me. I lie around all day, taking pills until my eyes rattle in my head and you bowl up into the trailer and read me the riot act. I find a case, some way to make a living, and that's not good enough either. You can see how I might be a tad confused. She set her jaw. There are other ways to make a living. I know. I tried them. I flicked out my hand to past horizons. I tried to study, to write, but the world of academia didn't want me. And Harry didn't want me either, if you remember. I paused, swallowed, closed my eyes for a moment, a face I had loved burning behind my closed lids. I felt Sal's hand on my sleeve. I brushed it off, plunged on. Then I tried to earn a crust smacking heads together, and I seemed to remember you hating that too. So I tried to step over that thin blue line, and that was when everyone here really rejected me. A showman copper, the ultimate betrayal. So, yeah, I might have known being a private detective wouldn't be good enough either. Will you listen to yourself? She snapped. The woes of Scott Jericho. Don't you ever wonder why we're all so wary of you? It's because you're like a moth to a flame with this sort of shit. And yes... I'm glad it's dragged you out of all that despair and self-pity, but what worries me is that one day the flame will catch and it won't just be you who burns. She then fixed me with a softer look. And as for Harry Morehouse... The waitress reappeared at my elbow, slapping down the bill, jolting me out of memories I'd rather forget. When I took out my wallet, she flapped a dismissive hand. Your money's no good here, handsome. The gentleman's already settled it for you. I looked up at her. What gentleman? Old friend of yours, so he said. Just popped in, paid your tab, then headed right back out again. Odd-looking fella, but friendly with it. A very generous tipper. Oh, there he is. See him waving, out by the road. She waved, her smile spreading like butter. Following her gaze through the diner's wide windows, I felt my hands close into fists. Chapter 11 I meant to ask, that camera looking out onto the car park, 
Oh, I was here last week and some bastard backed into my motor and didn't leave a note. I don't suppose I could take a look at your CCTV. The waitress gave me a pout that a Halibut might have envied. I'm sorry, Curly. Kids have been chucking stones at that thing ever since Marco installed it last summer. One was bound to hit the bullseye sooner or later. It's been out of action for months. I could ask around the regulars, though. Maybe someone saw something? I treated her to my most winning smile. A lack of car park surveillance suited me just fine. Don't worry, I said. But listen, would it be okay if I slipped out the back? I want to play a prank on my generous friend and I don't want him to see me coming. It's just a stupid joke we've had running since we were kids. She pressed both hands over her bosom as if she were a virtuous damsel and I'd suggested a midnight roll in the hayloft. Oh, I don't think I could allow that. It's staff only back there and Marco would have my guts for garters. My smile was now competing for best in show, Dimples working overtime. For good measure, I slipped a tenner into the front pocket of her apron and the dear old thing practically swooned. I took that as the green light. Collecting up my file, I scanned the diner. Won't be a minute, I said, and slid out of the booth. Much like the establishment itself, the clientele of Marco's American Bar and Grill was an eclectic assortment. Tucked into a siding just off the Oxford Road, the converted shipping container was hemmed in on all sides by forests so dense it was a miracle any motorist ever spotted it. A long, extinct neon sign ran across the roof, while trellis frames woven with plastic vines made a vain attempt to hide the rusted frontage. A horribly offensive statue of a Native American stood on one side of the entrance, hands raised in surrender to the gun-toting cowboy on the other. Inside was a feeble recreation of a fifties diner, posters for movies I'd never heard of crowding the walls. Still, the coffee wasn't bad. Among the patrons, a harassed-looking couple trying to wrestle their toddler away from a ketchup bottle, an improbable vicar chowing down a heart attack of a burger, and lined up on stalls at the counter, more trucker's butt crack than you could shake a stick at, I spotted just the man I needed. Tall, broad-shouldered, built like the proverbial shithouse, I thought he could pass, at least viewed from the back. Casting another glance through the window, I headed down the aisle towards my doppelganger. Drawing level, I dropped to one knee and started fiddling with my laces. The waitress hovered at my shoulder, by knocking off time, my guess was she'd have spun this story into something unrecognisable, yet her wildest exaggerations wouldn't come close to the truth. The guy frowned down at me. And yes, from the front, not exactly my double, but if he played along, that needn't be too much of a problem. He glared, wiped egg yolk from his logger's beard, and in return I tipped him a wink almost as theatrical as the waitress's. Hey there, big fella. Fancy earning a few quid? Fuck you on about, he grunted. Pushing a crumpled twenty across the table, I let him in on the prank. He was to take my place in the booth I just vacated, hang out there for ten minutes or so, stay in view of the road but keep his dubious mug turned away from the window. The waitress backed up my narrative, although she didn't look best pleased that he'd received double her original tip. To placate her, I poked another tenner into her apron and she was soon sweetness and light again. Still crouching, I asked if my pal remained at the roadside and she chuckled and waved, confirming he was. OK, Grizzly, I nodded at the trucker. You clear on the plan? Grizzly rolled his tongue around the inside of his mouth as if seeking guidance from a morsel of unchewed breakfast. Run it by me one last time. I sighed. Take your coffee to the fourth booth and spend ten minutes contemplating the mysteries of existence, the likelihood of alien intelligence, the popularity of ska music, anything you like. Only keep your back to the window. Sound good? He ran a dirty hand through his matted curls and shrugged. Seems weird to me, but it's your dollar. Good boy, I said. And as he took up position in the booth... I scuttled my way clear of the window.
It is true a few curious stares, but with food as inedible as Marco's before them, the diner's attention soon refocused on their plates. Meanwhile, the waitress guided me to a swing door behind the till. Marco's on a ciggy break, so if you're quick... She reached back and laid an unnecessary hand against my chest. Straight through and out the back door. He'll probably be on the phone to that bitch of a wife, so I doubt he'll notice you. Say hello to your friend from me. I left her with my most dazzling smile yet and stepped into the kitchen. Tiles greased to a yellowy sheen squeaked under my boots. From the ceiling, a thousand insects hung in wafting graveyards, while an unlucky few had escaped only to drop out of the flypaper and into the fire onto sizzling hot plates below. Although Marco could never be accused of false advertising, the photos in his laminated menus were honest enough representations, I think that on seeing this breeding ground for botulism, even his least discerning diner might put down their fork. Making for the back door, I paused for a second at a preparation counter. There, a slimy chicken breast rubbed hazardous shoulders with mould-spotted lettuce. I reached across these delicacies and slid a paring knife from its block. I tested the edge against my thumb, razor sharp. So either Marco took an unlikely pride in his tools, or else this happy little blade had hardly been used. With the flat of the knife pressed against the inside of my wrist, I pushed through the back door. Birds twittered in the trees that banked up behind the diner. On the other side of the overflowing bins, Marco stood with his back to me, shoulders hunched like a man facing a firing squad. Even from this distance, I could hear the shriek of his wife. OK, so he might well be the world's most successful cereal poisoner, but in that moment, I felt for him. I headed as noiselessly as I could between columns of old oil drums and into the trees. I should have ample time, but my nerves felt raw, and I wanted this little sideshow over and done with. I moved quickly through the undergrowth, following the sweep of the forest around the diner to the weed-cracked car park out front. There, I paused, hand tightening around the knife. My friend remained near the roadside, texting now rather than waving. He looked up once or twice, and I followed his gaze to my broad-shouldered stand-in, still hunched in the booth. Good old grizzly. Time to finish this. Despite the rumble of the road, I trod carefully, anxious that a snapping branch not give me away. Reaching a row of lorries, I stepped out of the tree line and, moving to the front of one of the cabs, darted another glance at the roadside. Then I broke cover. I stayed low, swept between the cars until I found the one I wanted. He'd upgraded since my arrest. His ancient Fiat Panda traded in for a smart BMW coupe, but the decal in the back window gave him away. A Knight of St. George emblem, proudly on show. My borrowed blade flashed in the light as I went to work. No CCTV, no customers rolling out into the car park just yet. No one to see as I punched holes into four continental tyres. This done, I dropped the knife and plunged back into the trees, circling around until it was almost level with the road. I had to be fast now, and it had to look right. Barrelling up behind Lenny Kerrigan, I bellowed, Boo! in his ear. The fascist thug who had intimidated a hundred girls in burkas on their way to school now leapt out of his skin. I practically caught him on the descent and, looping an arm around his neck, held the bastard in a brotherly headlock. Back in the diner, the waitress laughed and waved us away like we were naughty kids while Grizzly shot me a thumbs up and went back to his coffee. Meanwhile, Kerrigan squealed like a stuck pig as I hauled him into the cover of the trees. Chapter 12 At the service station, I'd thought he might be a paranoid delusion conjured out of guilt and pills. But he was here now. The waitress had seen him, he'd paid my bill, and he was currently kicking and struggling against me as I dragged him into the undergrowth. Whatever was going on, I had to end this. Two more lives were on the line, and I couldn't afford the distraction of Kerrigan dogging my footsteps. At a safe distance from the diner, I threw him to the ground. Despite being winded, Kerrigan didn't waste a moment. 
Scrabbling to his feet, he reached behind to the back of his belt. I didn't need my months in uniform to tell me what was about to happen. Knife attacks are common enough on fair grounds, and by eighteen I'd experienced my fair share. A memory in the dappled gloom of the wood, my father with a wooden pencil in his fist, teaching me what to do if some crazed joskin came at me. I put the old lesson to use. Kerrigan's was an ornate pig sticker. I didn't get a clear look, but I thought there was some sort of device on the hilt. Probably a Nazi insignia. Fascists are so unoriginal. And, as sure as night follows day, there was that shit-eating smirk, tugging at the corner of his mouth. The fact that Kerrigan's parents had probably been close relatives might account for some of the stupid, but my guess was that he worked hard to nurture an innate fuckwittedness. Why else would he taunt the man who'd already given him the pummeling of his life? In the end, it was a dull contest. He came at me, jabbing, arms wide, torso unprotected. I waited for the pullback, stepped inside his range of attack, gripped the wrist of his knife hand and landed a sickening punch against the inside of his elbow. The weapon fell from nerveless fingers and I kicked it across the grass. Meanwhile, Kerrigan's eyes bolted like a pair of skinned eggs and spittle fizzed between his teeth. Holding onto my shoulder for support, he tried to claw my face. I batted his hands away, but he kept at it, so in the end I was forced to nut him square in the nose. His legs came unhinged and he dropped like a scarecrow cut from its pole. I shook out my fist, tried not to smile. Sal's words from this morning came back to me. You're like a moth to a flame with this sort of shit. Much as I might try to deny it, she was right. I was alive again because of violence, the need to avenge it, the need to inflict it, perhaps the need to embrace it before it turned on me. I looked down on this child murderer whimpering at my feet and forced myself to resist it. I'll have you for this, Kerrigan gasped. You think you've lost everything. I'll see you back inside by tonight and then I'll get my lawyers to take that tin can you call a home. I'll have everything your old man owns too, the old fucking carnival. No, I sighed. You won't. Taking him by the shirt front, I dragged Kerrigan to his feet. He winced as I straightened his collar, a spill of blood issuing from his nose. Your fingerprints are on that knife, Lenny. I have witnesses who will testify you came to the fair yesterday and made threats against me. I hushed him when he started to protest. They'll say you did, and that's all that matters. You've been following me, stalking me. They'll have you on CCTV, both here and at the garage last night. Kerrigan didn't need to know Marco's security was out of commission. I'll say you came at me with the knife and I was forced to defend myself. Catching sight of his arm, I frowned and turned his wristwatch to the light. And maybe, just maybe, it'll be me who comes for the last pot you pissed in. He pulled his hand away, cheeks flaming. Why are you here, Kerrigan? I muttered. Are you just trying to fuck with me, or is it something else? Could he be involved in the killings? I wouldn't put anything past this mullering scumbag, let alone the butchery of Adya Mahal. But Kerrigan was your common or garden psychopath. Oh, he'd happily push a lit rag into a building where he knew children slept, but his brutality was circumscribed by the limits of his imagination. I already felt that a subtler and infinitely more dangerous mind than Kerrigan's was at work. Still, his next words troubled me. You have no idea what this is all about do you? The great fucking detective and you can't see what's staring you in the face. I gave him a hard shake. Are you involved? Three people are already dead and I won't. Yeah, that's right. Three dirty pole kids and you just can't let it go, can you? I was satisfied. He had no idea about McAllister, Poole and Mahal. But there was something here I didn't understand, so I let his hateful mouth run on. You're in for a big surprise, Jericho. One day soon, you'll wake up and realise just how well I've played you, and there won't be a motherfucking thing you can do about. 
something over my shoulder seemed to catch his eye, and his mouth snapped shut. I turned. A spark of silver, like a tinkerbell in some corny kid's film, darted between the trees. Probably just a trick of the light, but then why had it stopped Kerrigan in his tracks? I shook my head. I had enough mysteries on my plate without chasing fairies through the woods. I pushed Kerrigan aside and, using my sleeve, stooped to collect his knife. I'll be seeing you, Jericho, he muttered, his head thrown back to stop a fresh rush of blood. I didn't bite back. He'd find out soon enough that he wasn't following me anywhere, at least not today. Out of the trees, I kicked his flattened tyres and gave the waitress a final wave. She shot me a salacious wink before returning to her customers. Seconds later, I was behind the wheel and hauling my trailer in the direction of Bradbury End. Theories as to the killer's M.O., guesswork about possible connections between the victims, were fine as far as they went, but I needed a concrete base for my investigation. As Garris might say, I had to start with first principles. What was the wellspring of these murders? The deaths of the Jericho freaks. That meant heading back to where it all began. I was about five miles outside of town when my phone rang. I hit the hands free. Mr. Jericho. Mr. Campbell. His tone was flat, like someone giving a half-hearted impression of the paedophile professor. I thought you'd like to know... Your first day's payment has been transferred to your account. About that, I said. I've already incurred a few expenses. Text me, he said airily. Miss Barton will see to it. A beat. I thought he'd be keen to hear what progress I was making, but the silence stretched on. You didn't mention the local council had invited my father to set up his fair at Bradbury, I said a big event to mark the 150th anniversary of the tragedy, and all of this coinciding with the murders. Indeed, he yawned. Quite the coincidence. Isn't it just? A virtual pin appeared on my sat-nav, a pulsing Bradbury end moving ever closer. Do you believe in such coincidences, Mr. Campbell? Why shouldn't I? History is littered with them. Mark Twain's birth and death coincided precisely with the appearance of Halley's Comet. Less than a year before John Wilkes Booth assassinated Lincoln, his brother saved the life of Lincoln's son in a near-fatal railway accident. Even for an atheist such as I, the sweep of history can sometimes suggest a designing intelligence. Policemen don't like coincidences, I said. A good job you're not a policeman any more, then, isn't it? I ignored the jibe. According to my father, the town council booked the fair a year ago. Six months later, McAllister is turned into Charlie Buckley. Could it be one of the organisers, do you think? The mayor, Hillstrom, is descended from the guy who ordered the rebuilding of the bridge. And then there's his dog's body, Carmody. A dog's body making a dog-faced boy? Campbell tittered. Anything is possible, I suppose. Three down, two to go, I said, more to myself than the professor. I think he's going to speed up. The anniversary is in, what, four days? He'll want his masterpiece in place by then. Yes, yes, Campbell yawned again. I'm sure you're right. Godspeed, Mr. Jericho. The line went dead. I stared at the phone. The sudden and utter uninterest of a man who had virtually pleaded with me to investigate his pet mystery was another puzzle to add to my growing collection. Perhaps, having handed over the case, Campbell's passion for it would only be reawakened when, and if, I solved it. It was an idea, but not a very satisfactory one. Somehow, it both chimed and sat at odds with my earlier thought that his fascination with the case went beyond the explanations he had given. I shook my head. In the end, I decided to file it away with the mystery of those vague promises of Kerrigan's. One day soon you'll wake up and realise just how well I've played you. No more distractions. On now, to Bradbury End.
The town itself sat in the bowl of a forested valley. A sign marking the outskirts provoked a wry smile. A place with a history. No fucking kidding. I towed the brake and the car wound down into quaint meandering streets. The fair and its wide loads wouldn't have an easy time of this. Garden walls bulged out into the road, while corners jagged at switchback angles. Still, travellers were used to negotiating tight spots, and I was sure the cosy facade of Bradbury End would survive unscathed. Victorian villas in pastel shades, little old ladies at the bus stop, twittery as fresh-hatched chicks, men with sergeant-major moustaches walking droopy-eyed dachshunds. A village post office with an honest-to-God red phone box outside. The local pub, the old cock inn, not a hint of a satirical phallus graffitied onto the flaking sign over the door. Everything achingly, almost artificially English, like a Hollywood cliché of bygone Britannia. Except, not quite. A placard, planted proudly in an immaculate lawn, screamed... No Sharia, Britain first. Protest the new mosque in Bradbury. Something my dad said last night came back to me. They have new bogeymen now. He was right. Hate never goes away. It just moves on to fresh targets. Tired of the novelty of the fair on their common, travellers would once have been blamed for whatever ills were besetting the community, and taking the hint would pack up their amusements before they could be run out of town. Now we were probably viewed as a harmless eccentricity, as British as that unmolested phone box. It took a few laps of the town to find what I was looking for. Spotting the homely red brick building at last, I pulled my trailer up to the curb and got out. The smell of fresh-cut grass, the sound of a cricket match in a nearby park, all is well in Bradbury End. I looked over at the library. My heart slammed into my throat. A man stood in the doorway, a figure from my past, a face I had tried to forget. When I'd last seen Harry Morehouse, he had just murdered his father. Chapter 13 Harry's gaze had found my trailer, a frown crumpling his brow, when an army of middle-aged women crowded in around him, beaming and cooing. I caught snatches of their outrage. Never thought I'd see the day. We'll be here first thing with our placards. If Mr. Hildstrom and his cronies on the council think they can close our library, they have another think coming. Harry soothed and encouraged, winning the adoration of all, but then he'd never needed words for that. I've met many men with kind smiles, some masking horrors you wouldn't believe, but Harry's, open and generous, was a true reflection of his soul. It was his kindness that had made me love him. It was his kindness that had made him a killer. It was the end of my first term at Magdalen, and I was huddled up in my old donkey jacket by the fire of the eagle and child. The pub was packed to the rafters that night, Ruggerbuggers hogging the bar and spilling more lager than they drank. Tutors clubbed together, tired and demob happy. Townies in the corners, nursing their ales and resentments. I guess it said something about me that, despite the squeeze, no one asked if they could share my table. I'd arrived in Oxford with such hope. A lamb to the intellectual slaughter. My dad drove me, helped carry my cases through echoing cloisters and up winding staircases to my room that overlooked the river. He barely said a word, just sniffed and glanced around as if all this medieval beauty was no more than he'd expected. We shook hands, a thing we'd never done before, and he muttered something about seeing me at Christmas. In my imagining of this moment, I'd had him wipe away a tear and tell me how proud my mum would have been. None of that. Just a rough handshake, and he was gone. But still, I was here. I'd fulfilled the expectations of a dozen teachers, the ones who came and taught at the fair during our travelling months, and those that welcomed showman chavvies into their schools over the winter, and become the first person in my family to go to university. My mum had given me my love of stories, 
My teachers had instilled a passion to dig beneath the narrative. Now I could be among people who felt the same way I did about books. That was the dream. It lasted until the end of my first week. Tutors tore my essays to pieces. My observations in class were laughed at. It seemed that loving literature wasn't enough. If you wanted to justify that love, you must dissect it until, staring down at the corpse of the book you'd once worshipped, all you could see were its defects. And if the geniuses I'd revered as a teenager, Austin and Dickens, Hardy and Eliot, were so flawed, then what hope was there for my own poor scribblings? And so I'd stopped volunteering opinions in class, and dismissed any idea of joining the college's creative writing club. In halls, I was treated like an exotic curio. Somehow, word had slipped out about my background, and I became the subject of endless interrogation at the college bar. It was mostly good-natured and not particularly class-based. Of course, Maudlin was teeming with public school types who viewed anyone without a private ski lodge in the Pyrenees as an object of pitiable fascination. But even my state school peers were in awe of me. A fairground boy. Amid these dreaming spires, a Jericho freak indeed. All I wanted to do was talk to them about their world, a place in which books and paintings and art could provoke a tear, and you'd never be mocked for it. But they had plenty of friends to discuss such things with. They wanted to hear my story, while all I longed for was to escape it. And so, I created a persona for myself. Brittle and brooding, until at last, they stayed away. Some had stopped by my room before leaving for the break. A timid knock, a whispered "Merry Christmas," the odd question, "Are you going back to the fairground for the holidays?" But aside from a few special events, most fairs are packed up for the winter. The travellers heading for their yards, where, for a few short months. Trailers are swapped for static chalets. My dad would have been ours, spinning yarns with Sam Earnshaw and Tommy Radlett and the rest. We'd stopped calling each other after the first few weeks, defeated by the challenge of trying to bridge a gulf neither of us could understand. Sal Myers still phoned and updated me on all the news. One of the aunts had broken a hip. There'd been a ruck with some locals at the season end fair. She'd met a traveller from up north, and they might start seeing each other. How was I doing? Had I made friends with all the other brainiacs? I stared into the rich amber of my pint. I knew I wasn't suited to Oxford; that it made me miserable; that I didn't like who I was becoming here. But to go back to the life with my towel between my legs—that would be admitting that my dad and his friends were right; that travellers had no business in a place like this. Back then, they didn't know that it wasn't just the love of books that made me different. And that going away had been a chance to explore other parts of myself too. In all that self-pity, I hadn't realised that the pub had fallen silent. I looked up to find the lights dimmed and a group of carolers taking up position on the other side of the fire. Even the rugger buggers had settled, sipping their pints as quietly as overgrown babies taking the bottle. Firelight danced across the choir, old and young, grey-haired and fresh-faced. So close, I might have reached out and touched them. I sat back in my chair, thoughts of Maudlin and ruined dreams forgotten. A boy my age had stepped forward and started to sing. I wanted to turn away, to hide the tears streaming down my face. It was a Christmas hymn, but not one I'd ever heard before. And whether it was his sweet soprano, the simple emotion that animated his features, his beauty, or some combination of all three. He somehow spoke to all my hopes and disappointments. Afterwards, I lingered until the last drunk had offered his congratulations, and the other carolers had left. Then I slipped in beside him at the bar. It didn't occur to me then that he'd been waiting for me to say hello. Can I buy you a drink? He turned and nodded. I wondered when you would. A pint of Batemans, please. I signalled the barman. You were really good," I said. "Amazing, in fact. Is that your considered appraisal? If you can't take a compliment, 
I muttered. Hey! He placed his hand on my sleeve. I'm sorry. Thank you. And he smiled. A warm, open, teasing kind of smile. He was smaller than me, but then most guys are. Smooth, delicate features. Jade eyes and mouse-brown hair. Cheekbones that went on forever. He nudged his shoulder into my chest. Am I forgiven? We'll see. I smiled back. What's it called, by the way, that first one you sang? Quem Pastores Laudavere. It's an old German carol. He whom the shepherds praised. Are you a man of faith? Scott. Scott. Not in anything much. He lifted his hand to my face and ran his thumb under my eye, as if brushing away a tear. Maybe you believe in more than you think. I didn't know what to say to that, so said nothing at all. We took our drinks back to my table and sat there talking until last orders. Then we headed to a late-night bar he knew, found another table and talked some more. When the bouncer kicked us out at 5am, we took our talk to the ancient streets and eventually Folly Bridge, where we perched until dawn. I told him who I was, where I came from, what I'd hoped for in Oxford, and he told me about himself in return. A grammar school kid from the home counties, as respectably middle class as they came. He was studying musical analysis at Somerville. He was openly gay, out to his friends and family, a cherished only son, and lived for music. It only occurred to me later that, as probing as he'd been about my life, the hard persona I'd used to keep others at bay hadn't made an appearance. The more I spoke to him about the fair and my alienation from it, the easier my words became. Take a breath, he soothed. Tell me. And I did. At last he slipped his small hand into mine. Down by the university boathouses, doors were being pulled wide and practice crafts launched onto the misty river. Time to say good night, lonely traveller, he said. I pulled him close. You mean good morning? I did go back to the yard that Christmas. It was awkward with my dad, but it had been awkward with him for years and we soon fell into old patterns of meaningless small talk. But I was different. Sal noticed it straight away. I could never hide anything from her. She pressed her forefinger to my nose and beamed. You found someone. Who is he? She knew, even then, before I told anyone on the ground about my sexuality. The holiday passed with aching slowness, and within hours of being back in Oxford... I was at his door at Somerville. Happy New Year, lonely traveller, he grinned. I wrapped my arms tight around him. By the end of January, we were living together. By February, I knew I loved him. In March, nervous as hell, I told him so, and he gave me a wink and wondered why it had taken me so long. He loved me too, he said. With Harry beside me, I settled down to my studies. I still didn't enjoy them, but if it meant staying in Oxford, staying with him, I'd work my ass off. Those were the happiest months I've ever known. A bright island in a sea of darkness. At Easter, I met his father and saw immediately what Harry did not, or would not, acknowledge. The man was dying. By summer, the reality of his father's pain couldn't be denied, and within weeks, Harry had acted upon it. After that, everything changed. The army of women dispersed, and Harry came down the library steps. It was lunchtime, and he was probably heading into town for a sandwich. Heart raging, I stepped into his path. Hello, Has. He looked up, and in that moment didn't seem at all surprised to see me. Hello, Scott, he said, his tone resigned. I suppose you're here about the Jericho deaths. Chapter 14 The murders? My mind reeled. 
How on earth could Harry Morehouse know about the random killing of three unconnected people? In all our talk of my life on the fair, had I ever told him the story of the Jericho freaks? And if I had, no. Not this tender man I had loved. He'd killed, yes, but there were degrees of murder, and his was as far away from the psychotic savagery of the monster I hunted as could be imagined. But still, how did he know about the case, and what was he doing here? Murders? Harry frowned. I thought the drownings were accidental. Nothing I've seen in the research suggests anyone deliberately targeted the show people. Relief washed over me. You're talking about the bridge collapse? Of course. What did you think I meant? He smiled, though it was a confused and guarded version of the smile I'd known. Nothing. Never mind. I shook my head. But, Harry, what are you doing here? This place? He glanced over his shoulder at the modest red brick building. I drifted into it, I suppose. After I left Somerville, I tried out a few things before volunteering at our local library. When one of the librarians there retired, I applied for her job and they took me on. Then austerity started to bite and our branch was closed down. Instead of making me redundant, they created this sort of floating position. Now I move between about a dozen different branches on a rotor system. I see. But listen, what you said just now... It sounded like you'd been expecting me. For about a month or two. He nodded. We get quite a few people contacting the library service, asking if we can help with their research. Mostly it's amateur historians, bored retirees looking into their family tree, that sort of thing. Just occasionally, something interesting lands in our lap. This ex-Cambridge professor got in touch a while back about the Traveller's Bridge tragedy, said he was fascinated by fairground history and wanted to know more about what had happened to the Jericho Freak Show. I didn't... Colour sketched itself across his cheeks. At first, I wasn't sure I wanted to get involved. Professor Campbell happened to mention that you might be helping him out at some point, and I... Did he... know about us? I asked. I don't think so. Why would he? Coincidences, I murmured. They were becoming practically Dickensian, disparate threads of my life winding together around this case. But, as Campbell had said, coincidences do happen, and if I fixated too much on them, I might start seeing patterns in things that weren't there. Why did you stay involved? I asked. Harry looked away. If you were researching for Campbell, I knew we were bound to run into each other sooner or later. After all... Here was where you'd always begin, and not just because of the research. I don't think we ever visited a town where you didn't drag me inside the local library. He was right. It was a kind of homage, I suppose. Maybe an act of contrition, too. Being a travelling kid of no fixed abode, it had been difficult to get a library card from the places we pitched up in. And so, with a father who refused to pay for the books I devoured, I had stolen hundreds. I took a breath, felt my pulse skip. There was no point trying to avoid it. I'm sorry if the idea of seeing me again has upset you. Has, you know it wasn't my choice to end things the way they did. After what happened, I tried calling and writing. I even turned up at your house. Your family said you didn't want to see me, and in the end, I had to respect that. It was hard but I came to terms with it. I don't know if you ever got the notes I left at your flat when I moved back into halls, but I meant every word. Even if you didn't want to be with me anymore, I needed you to know that I understood what happened with your dad. Tears flashed into his eyes and he looked away. Don't. Scott. Please. I can't. Hey. I touched his arm. I can leave, OK? Campbell has probably given me all the research material you have. Anyway, I didn't know he'd already been in touch with the library here. Harry, listen, I have to be in town for a few days, but I can make it so that we never have to see each other. 
I don't know what happened between us, and I'm not asking you to tell me. All that was a long time ago. But I don't want my being here to distress you. I was turning back towards the road when he snagged my sleeve. Scott, wait. He shook his head. Maybe if you come inside we can talk and... I don't know. Just talk. I've been rehearsing this moment so much in my head. And now that it's here, everything I thought I'd say has gone out the window. All I know is I'm glad to see you again. It was hard to resist the hope I felt then. For over a decade, Harry Morehouse had barely left my thoughts. I'd tried to replace him, to paper over his memory, but like the ghosts of the Malinovsky children, he wouldn't be denied. In fact, it had only been since their deaths that Harry had fallen a little into the background. Perhaps because the comfort of our memories together had felt like an indulgence I no longer deserved. Now he guided me into the snug little library. An old boy was storing away in the reading section, while toddlers on scatter cushions sat, mouths agape, as Harry's colleague read to them from a pop-up book, and into a cramped back office overflowing with books. I stayed by the door while he flipped the switch on a kettle that nested precariously on the windowsill. So, are you still writing your music? I asked, as he rummaged in a cupboard for cups. Still composing? He puffed out his cheeks. Come on, Scott. Even you have to admit I was never all that good. I admit no such thing. Those pieces you used to play me back in our flat? Has. They were beautiful. He kicked the inside of my boots with the toe of his shoe, an old habit that brought back a flood of memory. To a sympathetic ear, maybe. Beneath all that cynical brooding, you were always a sentimentalist. That's why you never took to literary criticism. You get too caught up in the romance of the big picture and can't see the little mistakes staring you in the face. You liked my music because it was heartfelt, but that's all it ever was. Emotional, haphazard, shambolic. You think... I'm too emotional. I almost laughed. You were? He turned to the window where steam from the kettle made a halo around his head. Like you said, that was a long time ago. I suppose I don't know who you are now. I leaned back against the door. Well, I know who you are. A librarian and therefore a hero. He came over and pressed a warm mug into my hands. An unappreciated one, if I am. I heard. Hillstrom and Carmody and the local council are closing you down. They're trying to. Our users have started the fight back. Petitions, marches, the usual stuff. But what about you? I heard you left Oxford soon after I... murdered your father. We kept dancing around it. You know, I... Never really enjoyed Oxford, I said. I stayed because other things kept me there. He looked into his tea. And after? I didn't want to go into that. A broken heart makes for a dark, guiding star, and it had led me into many murky places before Pete Garris had found me. This and that, I said. Well, it hasn't done you any harm, he chuckled. In fact, you don't look a day older. Really? You do, and better for it. It was true. The boy had gone and the man stood in his place. Older, wiser maybe, more himself anyway. Please tell me you're still singing at least, I said. Maybe you can guess. Do you still do your old tricks? I cast a quick glance around. Even amid the office clutter, the clues were pretty obvious. I pointed to a chipped Hello Kitty mug on the desk. Honey and lemon, and no cold. Without thinking, I stepped forward and placed my fingertips close to his throat. He didn't pull away, but I let my hand fall. You're still singing. He moved back to an office chair and took a seat, cradling his cup in his lap. And so you're, what, a hired researcher? Something like that. How mysterious. What about your writing? 
I had only ever shared my stories with Harry. After we parted ways, they had remained private scribblings in my notebook, until the Melanovsky case and its aftermath had taken away any desire I had left to write. I'm back with the fair, I said. What? But you said you'd never... I know. Best laid plans. Anyway, it's not what you... Th the office window gave onto the street where my trailer was parked, and as the steam from the kettle cleared the pane, I could make out two figures circling the tin box I called home. One kicked at the wheels and his companion laughed. I put my cup on the desk and turned to the door. I'm sorry, Harry. Will you excuse me for a moment? Chapter 15 I stalked towards the road, an irrational anger scratching under my skin. During my time in uniform, I'd often worked with the kind of officers currently lounging against my trailer. Best practice was usually to send them back to the car to make a report while cooler heads interacted with the suspect. Problem was, there were no cooler heads present that day. Not mine, not theirs. The fuck's going on here? I asked. I knew from their shared smirk I'd made a mistake, that the wisest thing to do was wind my neck in. But my nerves were raw. Dealing with Kerrigan at the diner, finding Harry waiting for me in Bradbury End, my hunger to solve these murders and the strange sense that parts of my life were being threaded into the case, all of it coalesced into the frustration that sang behind my eyes. The officers, both a bit long in the tooth to still be on the beat, kicked their heels against the echoes and stood upright. They came swaggering to meet me, thumbs hooked into their belts. They had that patronising, let's-be-reasonable air, the kind that, with little provocation, can transform into sanctimonious fury. The first, balding and red-bearded, held up his palm, as if he expected me to rush them. Calm down, sir. Now, is this your vehicle? No, I said, forcing myself to stop. I'm just wildly pissed off on behalf of a complete stranger. Goodness me, sir, but you do have a temper, don't you? The second officer, scrawny and bird-faced, grinned. Any reason why you don't like the thought of us in the vicinity of your caravan? I shrugged. I was hoping to sell it, and to be honest, boys, it's a shitty enough-looking wreck without two dickheads bringing down the tone. If I could ask you to moderate your language, Redbeard said, shooting a troubled glance at a host of non-existent passers-by. If you've nothing to hide, then there's nothing to be worried about, is there? All we'd like to do is take a look inside your charming caravan. On what basis? Birdface blinked. I'm sorry? You want to search my home, so you either have a warrant or reasonable grounds to consider me a suspect in some crime. What are your grounds? For the first time, I wondered if Kerrigan had reported me for assault. It seemed unlikely, but nothing about how this day was panning out would have surprised me. You're behaving quite aggressively, sir, Redbeard observed. That in itself isn't enough. I have videos of you kicking my tyres and laying your flabby asses against my paintwork. I brandished my phone cursing myself that the idea of actually filming these pricks had only just occurred to me. So, do you want to know what I think is really going on here? The fair's coming into town in a few days. You saw what you'd call a pikey's caravan and you thought you'd have a bit of fun. I'm not a Romany myself, but mistaken racial profiling is still racial profiling. Now, now, Birdface placated, it's nothing like that. I chuckled and stepped around them giving the fuckwits a wide berth so that they had no excuse to feel threatened and come at me with their batons. At the trailer, I took out my key and opened the door. Go on, then. Fill your boots, I said, sweeping a welcoming hand over the threshold. Just know I'll be taking your badge numbers and putting in an official complaint. Are your records in that department squeaky clean, boys? Is your senior officer going to want to dirty his hands with you again? Or will it be a uh, dressing down from the chief constable this time? Sir Michael Wishman, isn't it? Yeah, I think he plays golf with my old mate, DCI Pete Garris.
It was an educated guess, but I could see from their faces that I'd hit the bullseye. Weathered old turds like these don't remain on the beat out of choice. Even if they were happy in uniform, they'd have found cushy admin roles by now. Progression halted by a string of dodgy arrests had been my bet. Now I cashed in the chips. Come on, I sighed. I haven't got all day. You up for the tour, or what? They exchanged narrow glances and Birdface sucked his teeth. Just get it shifted, he said. This is a public thoroughfare. Redbeard spat on the curb and they toddled off in search of less challenging prey. I smiled to myself and closed the door. With some of my off-prescription benzos lying around in open drawers, it had been a risk, but I knew that playing nice would have got me precisely nowhere. When bullies bark at you sometimes, the only thing you can do is bark back. Scott, what was that? I turned to find Harry standing behind me, his long nervous fingers twining together. That was par for the course when you're a traveller, I said. He looked troubled. I suddenly realised why. In the beginning, before loving him had softened my edges, he had known that old Oxford persona, brooding and tetchy. But this new darkness, this well of rage always stewing under the surface, that was a Scott Jericho he hadn't met. A personality forged in the grief of losing him and refined in the deaths of Sonia Malinovsky and her brothers. I decided then that he shouldn't see it again. The fair isn't licensed to arrive on the common for a few days, I said. Do you know any local caravan parks where I could set up until then? He laid his hand against his cheek, an old anxious habit. I've got a driveway at my bungalow. You can park it there if you like. Has, I don't think. It'll be fine, he cut in. You'll just need to find somewhere to wait until my shift's over. Meet me back here at six. Before I could say another word, he disappeared into the library. Three hours to kill. I slid behind the wheel of my murk and headed out of town, finding a siding on one of the rural roads. I flipped on the radio and listened to news and traffic reports, pop songs and afternoon dramas, taking in nothing. By four, the clouds broke and a drizzle ticked relentlessly against the windscreen. After a while, I went back to Campbell's file but found nothing fresh in those now familiar atrocities. In all this, I knew I was trying to distract myself from Harry's invitation and what it might mean. Just an old acquaintance being kind, my hollow heart told me. Nothing more. At quarter to six, the sun was blazing again, and I drove through steaming streets to find Harry waiting at the curb. When he waved, I felt a ridiculous lump in my throat. Lock's broken, I said, leaning over and opening the door for him. I snatched the case file off the passenger seat and stuffed it into my side compartment. So, I breathed, are you sure about this? He held his leather satchel to his chest like a shield. Of course, but if you'd rather not stay... I released the parking brake. Where's home? Home was a suburban cul-de-sac just outside Bradbury End. It took ten minutes or so for me to uncouple the trailer and sight it, with Harry's help, in the drive of his bungalow. I asked if I could hook up to his electric and he agreed, waving away any talk of payment. I said I'd get him a bottle of Antinori Tignanello as a thank you. I think we both thought then of his flat back in Oxford, curled up together on the sofa, lips plummy with the aftertaste of his favourite wine. So your research for Campbell is a sideline? he asked as I chocked the trailer wheels. You're mainly back working on the fair with your father? Despite constant requests, Harry had never met my dad nor been to any of the Jericho fairs. Back then, the idea of those parts of my life colliding had been hideous to me. It's a bit of extra cash, I grunted. Campbell found me while researching the Jericho family tree. Harry ran his fingers across the mud-splattered side of the trailer. You always said you'd never go back. Yeah. I straightened up. Well, 
A lot's happened since then. By the way, I heard some of the council was opposed to the fair coming here at all. He rolled his eyes. They're a fun bunch. Last year they put a block on Bradbury's first ever Pride event. Said it wasn't suitable for a family town. <laughs> like we aren't members of families, too. Hillstrom and Carmody's work. Mayor and deputy, the gruesome twosome. He nodded. Like the rest of the council, a little to the right of Mussolini. Some people think they're even behind the anger that's being stoked up against the new mosque. I saw the signs on my way in. I nodded. But to be fair, they were all for marking the anniversary of Traveller's Bridge. They said it was right to celebrate such a historical landmark in the town's history. You mean the drowning of five people? Tasteful, isn't it? He winced. But hey, w what's this? I'd been bending down to firm up one of the chocks when he snatched the notebook out of my back pocket. I'd recognise these moleskins anywhere. I thought from what you said that you'd stop writing. Why would you... I spun around, grabbing the book from his hand. He took a step backwards. Scott, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... No, I said, smoothing the cover with my palm. It's okay. I just don't show anyone my stories. Not anymore. Of course. That was rude of me. But look, let's go inside. I'll make us something to eat. Following him into the boxy 70s bungalow, I wondered if I should tell him about the case. In a sense, Campbell had already made Harry a part of it, asking him to take on research without revealing the bigger picture. But now that Haz was taking me into his home, was it right to keep him in the dark? The killer I was hunting had his pattern, but without yet knowing the logic behind his victim selection, it was possible he might target the people I was close to, especially if he knew I was on his track. I raked fingers through my hair, the people I was close to. The truth was, I didn't want Harry to know about this world in which I felt so stimulated and at home. That moody kid he'd known back in Oxford was as shadowy now as the Malinowski children who waited in the trailer behind me. I closed my eyes. I thought, on balance, I could keep him safe without exposing him to the horrors of the case. In the end, that turned out to be just another of my mistakes. Chapter 16 Ella Fitzgerald accompanied me as I wandered around the open-plan living room kitchen. An old bluesy number, it stirred memories of lazy Sunday mornings in Oxford, slants of dusty daylight, his head resting against my chest. It shouldn't be long, Harry called from the kitchen. He diced and stirred, intently focused as he always had been when cooking. On the shelves next to his vintage garage turntable, I played my fingertips across hundreds of records. Everything here from Renaissance magicals to gangster rap. I'd always enjoyed music, but it had never spoken to me the way it spoke to Haz. I was glad he could still get pleasure from it. My gaze swept other shelves where framed photographs stood among knickknacks I didn't recognise. Nothing much from our Oxford flat. It seemed that his records were among the few survivors from those days. I saw a couple of familiar photos, though. A cherubic has in the arms of the beaming mother who had died when he was too young to remember her, and holiday snaps from his teens. Barcelona, Cape Town, Sydney. A boy shy and sun-flushed. No pictures of the music teacher father from whom he had inherited his passion. How long have you been here? I asked. He looked up from the stove. A year. Just over. I peered through the lounge window to the bungalow opposite. A sign similar to the one I'd seen earlier was staked a little drunkenly into the lawn. Say no to the new mosque. Keep England pure. Lovely neighbours, I observed. Oh, yes, he agreed, following my gaze. They're charmers, all right. There's going to be some kind of demo against the opening of the mosque this week. There'll be quite a crowd, I reckon. First the library protest and now this, I said. What a vocal lot these Bradburians are. Yep. He went back to his bubbling pans. It pains me to say it, but 
a small minority will be protesting at both, pro-library and anti-Muslim. Makes me wonder if they've actually read any of the books they say they want to protect. You know, I think for some of them, it isn't the library itself they're interested in saving. It's the simple fact that the building has been there for so many years. Its venerability is the thing that makes it valuable in their eyes, not its purpose. I nodded. Libraries are revolutionary. When they first started spreading in the 1800s, they were seen as the working man's university. It's no wonder authoritarian governments have never liked them. I remember that speech, he chuckled. I think I got it every time you drag me around to a new one. I smiled. Well, I guess you kind of hated me all that much after we finished. I mean, you ended up working in the places I love. I'd said it lightly, no edge at all, but my words were met with silence. When I looked over, Harry was standing with his palms planted on the countertop. He kept his head down, as if checking the two steaming plates in front of him. Don't you understand what happened back then, Scott? Don't you know why I... When I took a step towards him, he looked up, his eyes bright. Doesn't matter. Let's eat. Has. His look became hard. An alien expression for Harry Morehouse. Let's just eat. And so we did. Swedish meatballs with mashed potato and lingonberry jam, his Nordic grandmother's recipe and a treat he would rustle up whenever I'd felt down. It tasted just as good as ever and coaxed more memories, harsh as lemon juice in a cut. I ate and tried to divert my mind from the past. Today had been a washout. I'd intended to spend it on local research, laying the historical foundations for the investigation, trying to find any telling detail in the bridge tragedy that Campbell might have missed. I hadn't known then that he had his own researcher on the spot, and that everything to be found in the library archive was already in the file. It was time to move on. The crime scene photos Campbell had obtained were all well and good, but I knew from experience that even a cold location can give up its secrets. Tomorrow, I'd head for Anglesey and the scene of the first murder. How is it? Harry asked. I held up a speared meatball. Good as ever. And prepared in lightning speed. I had some ready-made in the freezer. Because it was my favourite and you were expecting me? By the way, he said, scraping his spoon around the plate. There is one other source on Traveller's Bridge we could try. Gerald Roebuck. He's a local eccentric and a bit of an old nightmare, really. He runs a kind of unofficial museum out of his front room. Got some interesting stuff amid all the clutter. Anyway, he was my first port of call when Professor Campbell got in touch. There isn't much Roebuck doesn't know about Bradbury End, plus he's a mine of juicy conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories. You'll find out, Harry grinned. But I'm afraid he's away for a few days. He came in last week and told us his sister up north had been taken ill. I should be back by the time the fair's here, though. I know he's keen to interview the show people for his archive on the tragedy. I doubt they'll be able to tell him much, I said. Traveller's Bridge was only ever a bedtime story in our circles. I wasn't even sure it was real myself until 48 hours ago. He stared at me. You've only been working on this a couple of days. I don't understand. If the showmen have no information on the Jericho story, then why has Campbell employed you? It was a good question. Local colour, maybe, I said, returning my attention to my plate. We might not be able to give him specifics on the tragedy, but we can bore him to death with stories about the old freak shows themselves. He seems like the obsessive type who'd want that sort of detail. Harry looked doubtful. I suppose. After dinner, I helped him with the dishes. We stood side by side, hips almost touching as he swayed to Ella singing Summertime. It almost made me jealous how he could lose himself like that. I wish I could still do the same with my books. Twilight was reddening the kitchen when he suggested I take the spare bedroom. I shook my head. I wouldn't want to wake you. I've got an early start, and you remember what I'm like in the morning. 
until my third coffee I tend to crash into things. The bed in my trailer's cosy enough. I could do with a quick shower, though. Of course, he tapped his temple. I should have offered before dinner. Let me get you a towel. I let the shower run hot, bullets of scalding water scouring my flesh. My muscles ached from the exercise they'd taken that morning, dragging Kerrigan into the forest. I wondered again about the strange light that had caught his attention, that spark, like a reflection off glass, glittering waist-high between the trees. Something else nagged at me too, the cheap watch strapped around his wrist. Dressed again, I rubbed an oval in the steamed mirror. My eyes seemed sharper, but I could already feel the need for a zopiclone nibbling at my nerves. I'd allow myself one sleeping tablet tonight, and then see how tomorrow found me. Back in the hall, I called out a thank you to Harry, and, receiving no response, guessed he'd already gone to bed. It was full dark as I left the house, stepping the short distance between the front door and my trailer. Once inside, I acted on instinct. A single lamp silhouetted the man standing by my bed. He appeared to be going through my medications. I didn't take the time to assess whether it was Kerrigan, one of the disgruntled officers from earlier, or some stranger who might just turn out to be the psychopath I was hunting. Before he had a chance to react, I had my forearm locked around his throat and was lifting him, choking and spluttering from the ground. It was his smell that told me I'd made a mistake. His natural warm scent that hadn't changed since those nights we'd spent wrapped in each other's arms. I let him down at once and helped him to the bed where he looked up at me, his eyes huge. Has, I'm so sorry, I didn't know it was you. Christ, he said, his voice almost a sob. Jesus, Scott, what the fuck's wrong with you? He got unsteadily to his feet, slapping my hand away when I attempted to help him. I followed him out of the trailer to the bungalow, trying to explain. He didn't look back, just closed the door in my face and turned the key. I stood there on the step, not sure of what to do, when the phone buzzed in my pocket. Scott, it's Pete Garris, he said, before I could even speak. I've got that information you wanted. Professor Ralph Campbell, former Cambridge Don, defrocked, or whatever the hell they call it, after the police caught him in a kiddie pawn ring. That led to the discovery of actual abuse against a string of miners. He served three years. Came out about 18 months ago. Got a big compo payout after some other prisoners managed to corner him in his cell and cut off his nuts. Very public spirited of them, if you ask me. Although, they also gave him a pretty brutal kick in afterwards, which resulted in some spinal damage. Anyway, I'll text you all the grisly details. Scott? Y yes, thank you. Thank you, sir, I mumbled my palm flat against the jam of the door. I'm grateful. Look, what exactly have you got yourself mixed up in? A rare trace of concern tinted my old mentor's voice. Why do you need to know about some nutless old nonce living out in the sticks with his nanny? Scott, I think we should talk. Where are you? Bradbury End, I said hollowly. Where? You're breaking up. Yes, Pete, I think we should talk. I might need... I almost cried out. A warm, wet tongue was lapping at the back of my hand. Glancing down, I could hardly believe what I was seeing. Garris was still talking when I cancelled the call and dropped my haunches in front of the elderly boxer. My dad's old juke whined as I scratched behind his tattered ear. Webster, what the hell are you doing here? As if in answer... He turned his doleful head and cast sad eyes at the car idling across the street. The driver sat in a band of shadow and I couldn't make out his face. A splash of orange paint ran above the front wheel arch, stark against the Volkswagen's black bodywork. A detail so vivid it had to be deliberate, as if he wanted to be noticed. Beside me, the Webster whimpered again, and I suddenly noticed the cardboard container a little larger than a ring box attached to his collar. And I, still on the car, I unclipped the box and opened the flaps. I very nearly dropped the contents. Wrapped in greaseproof paper was a triangular wedge of human flesh. A piece of Ajamahal, I had no doubt, for upon the curling skin was a marker pen scrawl, a single letter, 
A for animus, the third word in the Traveller Bridge dedication. I straightened up and glanced back across the road, locking eyes with the killer who had found me. Chapter 17 I moved slowly at first, as if the murderer were an animal I didn't want to startle. Reaching over, I unclipped the trailer door and ushered Webster inside. He went peacefully enough, lumbering up the steps and collapsing almost immediately by the locker settee. Then the little cardboard coffin still in my hand, I started towards the road. It was a dry, airless night, not a breath of wind to stir the pruned bushes and crew-cut lawns of the cul-de-sac. With the moon behind it, Harry's side of the street hugged every scrap of darkness while the windows opposite and those of the killer's car dazzled. My heart hammered. In my mind, I flipped through the images of a file. McAllister strung to the tree, his dog's head lolling from the spike screwed into his torso. Agatha Poole, in her electrified tin bath, lightning twists of silver metal driven into her fingertips. Adya Mahal, caught in the apparent act of eating herself alive. Here was the author of those outrages, and at the thought of meeting him I again felt that dark thrill. His headlights blazed when I reached the roadside. The engine roared. Of course, he wasn't just going to sit there and let me come for him. The three murders he had committed with such measured brutality were only part of a larger design. Although my understanding remained hazy, I sensed that completeness was vital to his M.O., and there were still two Jericho freaks to recreate before this masterpiece was done. Turning to my Merc, I heard a squeal of tyres as the Volkswagen shot out of the cul-de-sac. Luckily, I had my keys in my pocket and was behind the wheel in seconds. I threw the box of flesh onto the passenger seat, feeling a brief stab of guilt as I did so, as if I'd somehow disrespected the remains of a victim who'd already suffered enough. My own headlights washed over the sleeping bungalows as I hit the throttle and swept out of Harry's drive. Two red eyes, smoky in the exhaust fumes, flared at the junction. Then the brake lights blinked out and the Volkswagen tore into the streets beyond. In its prime, my Merc might have made up the ground relatively easily. I bought it for a song from old Tom Radlett after coming out of prison. A favour to my dad, who in those early days had imagined I might need a car. Perhaps if I'd looked after it instead of letting it rust while I wallowed in nightmares and self-pity, it wouldn't be groaning and juddering around me now. As it was, all I could do was push the bleating engine to its limit. We flew on, careered around darkened streets where austerity had doused the light from every lamppost. My eyes scanned the spaces between cars from which some late-night dog walker might suddenly emerge. I'd taken an advanced driver course during my time in uniform, and as those old lessons came back to me, so did the constraints spelled out by our instructor. The roles of pursuer and pursued are not equal in these situations. When a sociopath is behind the wheel, whoever hunts him will always be at a disadvantage. For a killer who not only saw human life as expendable, but delighted in its destruction, the chances of capture were slim. Still, I aimed to give him a good scare. I owed that much to his victims. And so, cautious as I could be, I sent the Merc shrieking on its way. He led me on a white knuckle dance around those suburban streets, a chase that made the blood pound in my ears and drove all thoughts of Harry from my head. Jagging out of the estate, we hit a long stretch of road lined with takeaways and convenience stores. Faces made deftly by the fluorescent light of bus shelters stared out at us and I had no choice but to tow the brake. The killer did not slow. He slalomed between speed bumps, the Volkswagen's boot bouncing into the air when he caught one. Now illuminated, I saw that his license plate had been obscured by mud, not a patch of dirt on the rest of the car. Still, I knew this to be a blind. Like many of his kind, it was clear that this creature indulged in a strange mix of caution and hubris. The total absence of DNA at the crime scenes was telling, and yet he had taken the risk of goading me with Webster in the box. He had been working away unappreciated without an audience, and now he had one. That would stoke his ego. He wanted to be noticed, 
hence that flash of orange paint over the wheel arch. But that didn't mean he wanted to be caught. Not yet. And so, although the Volkswagen had almost certainly been stolen, the license plate was obscured to make me think it was, in fact, his own car. Leaving town, we plunged into rolling country lanes. As field and meadow flashed by, I wondered again, how had he become aware of me? I'd been on the case just over 24 hours, and apart from Campbell, I hadn't spoken to anyone about it. Except that wasn't quite true. To varying degrees, six people knew I was either interested in the Travellers' Bridge tragedy or actively investigating a case connected to it. Campbell himself and Miss Barton, Sal Myers and my father, Jeremy Worth, who had delivered the professor's message, and now Harry. It might not seem like all that many, but any CID detective will tell you that, as far as an active investigation is concerned, that's a pretty leaky ship. Even if none of them were directly involved, and for different reasons it was hard to see how any of them could be, a stray word might have been enough to alert the murderer. That brought me back to possible suspects. It still seemed that there were only two pools from which to draw, the travelling community or someone in Bradbury End. It was possible, of course, that a random researcher like Campbell had become morbidly fascinated with the story of the drowned freaks, but that seemed like a long shot. Had word spread from Sal or my father, then? Or could Campbell, Miss Barton, or possibly Harry have mentioned something to someone in Bradbury? Someone who had organised the anniversary celebration, perhaps? These ideas ricocheted through my head as we sped into a tangle of moonlit roads. Branches swatted my window. Trees came together, blocking out the sky. There were passing places every few hundred yards, but otherwise an oncoming vehicle would have no chance. Still, the killer didn't slow. I wondered then how alike we might be and if he too was feeling the exhilaration of the chase. I didn't like the idea and tried my best to bury it. All at once, we came out of the tree tunnel and onto a double lane that pointed arrow straight for a mile or more. Cornfields stood on either side, frozen in the breathless night. Only a slight flutter of stalks as they were caught in the killer's slipstream. My eyes narrowed. Up ahead, two blinking lights had appeared out of the dark. My head snapped right, and I saw the oncoming rush the signal warned of. Fuck. I kicked down on the throttle. The Volkswagen also put on an extra burst of speed. Our engines bellowed at each other as we ate up the road. I thought I might have gained a fraction, but another glance across the field turned my blood to ice water. A square of light in the driver's cab and then the impossibly long hulk of the goods train rocketing behind. Sweat tracked down my brow. I swallowed hard. The red crossing lights pulsed ever larger as the flimsy barrier started its trembling descent across the road. My speedometer shivered at seventy. The opportunity to break was closing. One way or another, I'd have to commit. Meanwhile, my quarry seemed to have made his decision and started to pull away again. Seconds now, metres in which to decide. So close I could see the red and white stripes on the arm of the barrier, could see the oil-black gleam of the tracks. The train gave an outraged wail as the Volkswagen flashed across its path, sparks leaping into the night as the barrier met the roof of the car. I'd been too slow. I had no choice. All I could do now was pray that I'd stop in time. My hands cemented themselves around the wheel. In the same instant, my left foot abandoned the throttle and I slammed on the brake. Wheels locked. Rubber burned. The murk fished out across the blacktop. A hundred bits of trash flew in all directions and I heard the smash of my mother's books in the boot. As I spun ninety degrees to face the cornfield, blue-black smoke from the tyres wafted across the windscreen. I'd stopped but on this side of the barrier, or on the tracks. In my panic, I couldn't tell. I cuffed sweat from my eyes, glanced through the passenger window. Jesus fu- The train blared past, barely a foot from the car, its hammer tread juddering into my bones. Resisting the lunge of my stomach, I unclipped my seatbelt, kicked open the door, and pulled myself free. At first, I thought my legs might give way, and I clutched at the roof for support. Over a mile long, the engine hauled its tankers and freight across the feathery expanse of the cornfield. A breath caught in my chest. In the spaces between cargo, I could see a man standing in the road beyond. He appeared like one of those cartoons in a kid's flipbook. 
a figure that only moved when you riffled the pages. Separated by the trundling mass of the train, I could only watch as he stared back at me through those glancing spaces. In the flashing red light of the crossing, I saw that he was wearing a balaclava and black gloves. He appeared to be of medium height, although since he almost blended into the night, it was difficult to be sure. Before getting back into the stolen car, he held up his hand and waved. Even then, I didn't feel that it was a mocking gesture, more like a sporting salute between opponents. A tip of the hat that said, Welcome to the game. Chapter 18 The tide was high when I crossed the Menai Strait, black water frothing as it surged beneath the piers of the Great Suspension Bridge that linked the Isle of Anglesey to the Welsh mainland. Summer seemed to have vanished, and an autumnal drizzle streaked the windscreen. Beyond the bridge, the island gave over some grudging space for a road that threaded out to its northern shore. This area was less desolate than some of the last miles of the mainland, where monolithic hills hid their crowns among lowering clouds, but there remained a kind of secretiveness to the country. Nameless lanes appeared out of nowhere, dips in the landscape fooled the eye. I remembered reading once that this had been among the final strongholds of the ancient princes of Wales, and that nationalism still had its natural home among the islanders. Looking about me, I couldn't say I was surprised. I opened the window a crack, and breathed in air salted by the Irish Sea. On the passenger seat, Webster growled in his sleep. I reached over and ruffled the scruff around his neck. If only the mutt could tell me who had brought him to Bradbury End. Returning to the cul-de-sac last night, I'd found the bungalow in darkness. By that time, the thrill of the chase had dissipated, and all I could think of was Harry's face staring up at me. The fear in those eyes after I'd mistakenly attacked him. I never wanted him to look at me that way again. I had stood on the doorstep, raising and lowering my hands, never quite summoning the courage to knock. I knew I ought to pack up and move on. Even without the danger posed by the man I hunted, I was pretty certain that I could bring Haz nothing but misery. But wasn't it already too late? The killer now knew where he lived, might even know of our past connection. At least if I stayed, I could keep an eye on him. That's the story I told myself. The truth was, after ten lonely years, I'd only just found him again. And yes, it wasn't the fairy tale reunion of my dreams, but nor was it the cold rejection I dreaded. We had been happy once, and perhaps I was reading too much into things, but he had seemed pleased to see me. Until I'd ruined everything, of course. Now he had glimpsed the violence I'd trailed in my wake, he probably wanted nothing more to do with me. It was as I turned back to the trailer, my mind set on leaving, that I saw the note taped to my door. I still had old love letters in that small, cramped hand. Keepsakes I cherished. Mouth dry, I unpeeled the note. Scott, I came to talk things over, but you'd gone off somewhere. BTW, where'd the dog come from? When I opened the door, he very nearly took my head off. Anyway, I realised that you probably thought I was some kind of intruder, so I'm sorry if I reacted badly. Let's talk when you get home tomorrow. H. Kiss. Home. I'd taken a shaky breath reading that word. He'd had every reason to reject me, but instead he was willing to offer me the benefit of the doubt. It didn't occur to me then that there was no caution in those words, nothing to reflect the fear he'd felt when he looked up at me. Back inside the trailer, I went to the area where Harry had been standing when I attacked him. My medications with their labels turned to the wall were untouched, while a bottle of mineral water stood to one side. That was what he'd been doing, leaving the water in a glass. I rubbed my eyes and rested his note against my pillow. Then I took out my phone and called Dad. After midnight, and his voice was clear as a bell, I sometimes wondered if he slept at all. You rocked up in Bradbury then? Everything all right? I had a run-in with some gathers, I sighed. Just the usual sort of din loss. 
He grunted at that. Don't go Barney in before we've even built up, son. I'll try my best. I put the phone on loudspeaker and slipped the cardboard box containing Adi Mahal's flesh from my pocket. Over by the locker settee, Webster continued to dream. About the dog, I began. God knows why you wanted to take that poor old jook with you, Dad muttered. You think I took him? A pause. That's what your note said. Took Webster for a bit of company. Thought it sounded overly sentimental for you. What are you saying? He didn't take him. Who left the note under my mat then? Calm down, Dad. He's here, safe and sound. Then I don't understand what you're saying. It doesn't matter. Scott, he grunted. I want a straight answer. This case, or whatever it is you're looking into, you promised me there was no danger to us. Is that still true? Because midnight phone calls do not put me at ease. I stared down at the box in my hands. There is someone dangerous in Bradbury End, I said, but I don't have any reason to believe that it will come after us. He has his rules and I think he'll stick to them. What's that supposed to mean? I almost told him then, but some words of my mother came back to me. You think the aunts are bad? Showmen are the biggest gossips on any ground and your dad is just about the worst of them. You want to keep a secret? Don't ever speak a word of it in front of George Jericho. It was true. Middle-aged travellers like my dad and Sam Earnshaw could while away whole days telling tales. Even if I swore him to secrecy, the truth about my investigation would be all over the fair by mid-morning. Then the killer might really have a reason to target the travellers. You're just going to have to trust me, I said. If there's any direct threat, I'll tell you. Always too close for your own good. He barked out a bitter laugh. Just like your mother. I started to remonstrate with him when he launched a curveball. That chap, Zack's been asking after you. Fond of you, I reckon. Just be careful you don't drag him into whatever mess you've got yourself involved with. He doesn't deserve to get hurt because of your recklessness. The phone went dead and I returned my attention to Webster and the box. The killer must have come onto the ground in the early hours, taken the jerk, and left the note. That suggested someone with access to my handwriting. Did that also rule out someone from Bradbury End? Not necessarily. The tabloid paparazzo, Maxine Tierro, who had continued to stalk me even after my release from prison, had gained access to a report I'd written on our first interview with Kerrigan. Her editor had published it under the banner Disgraced Cop Sabotages Murder Case. The story was probably still online, so anyone might study my handwriting at their leisure. I got up and placed the box in the crisper compartment of my fridge. I knew there was no point handing it over to the police. The smell of bleach on the greaseproof paper was strong. Just like the crime scenes, not a scrap of forensic evidence would be found. There had been one more surprise before leaving Bradbury. As dawn lit the road leading out of town, I saw the burned-out shell of a car still smoking in a lay-by. I didn't need to stop. I knew it was the stolen Volkswagen, and that it had been left in the hope that I might see it. Another message from the man in the balaclava. Hurry back, Scott. The fun is just beginning. The bay of Benlec sat in the scoop of the village that bore its name. A steep hill on one side plunged down to a stretch of rain-sodden sand and the grey tumble of the sea. On a better day, that water might sparkle, blue as the Adriatic. On the far side, the bay rose again at a gentler gradient to meet the coastal pathways that cut around to Red Wharf Bay, where Campbell had his holiday home. I drove on, past a charming whitewashed cafe, until I reached the eastern side of Benlec and the gate of the Sweet View caravan site. The location lived up to its name with a breathtaking panorama of the beach. I parked up and headed for the reception block. A few families in anoraks were braving the elements, kids with buckets and nets, excited chatter about crabbing pools. Entering the reception, I wiped the rain from my eyes. Borida? I smiled at the young woman behind the desk. She glanced up from her magazine and slid the lollipop out of her mouth. Don't try it on, sweetheart. 
You haven't got the accent. English? The obvious, I winced. She sighed and flipped a page. You're tied in a most, I'll give you that. But English is English. Anyway, if you're wanting a caravan, I'm all out, so a good morning in Welsh and a lush smile won't get you anywhere. She glanced at me again. I knock off at four, though, if you fancy a pint. Then, stretching her arms behind her back, she yawned and blinked. But maybe not. Gay, is it? I laughed. You'd make a good detective. Tidy and not Welsh. Had to be gay. So is that what you are, police? Journalist, I said. Her eyes lit up and she leaned forward. It was a trick I'd often played during my time in plain clothes. It doesn't matter how much you try to reassure them, witnesses are more likely to talk openly to journos than CID detectives. There's the freedom of being off the record, for one thing, plus the fact that media interest in their opinion does wonders for the public's ego. Of course, impersonating a hack was a disciplinary offence, but I'd never been caught, and Garris had always appreciated the results. Paper or telly? she wondered. Online. Be happy to pay you a little something for your time. Should we say forty quid? Her eyes went neon, and I kicked myself for going in so high. Still, it was Campbell's money, so I didn't feel too bad. I'd just like to ask you a few questions about what happened to your old boss. I made sure I filmed our interview, both to set the scene and so that I could review the footage later. It quickly became apparent that Adele, we'd made introductions, knew next to nothing about her late employer's murder. His body had been discovered by a rambler and the police had found McAllister's head and the torso of his dog, Bestie, inside his caravan. I asked her about the artist's mannequin left propped against his trailer window, the top-hatted figure with its articulated limbs twisted to resemble my contortionist ancestor, and Adele confirmed she had never noticed it amongst McAllister's belongings before the day of the murder. A killer's calling card, just as Campbell had observed. Adele admitted that McAllister had been an OK boss, a bit tight when it came to bonuses, but even that, her tone implied, did not warrant his ritualistic decapitation. And Bestie had been just adorable. Bit late in the day for all this, innit? She said, as we finished up. Old Bob's been dead six months or more. It's a feature piece I'm doing, I said, turning off the recording. You know this sort of thing. Clickbait for the morbidly inclined. Ten gruesome unsolved mysteries. Spooky crimes that will keep you guessing. She waved her lolly stick at me. You want spooky? You should go talk to that old witch Debney. Mad as a ferret and stinks twice as bad. I bet your readers would lap up all her ghost story bullshit. Debney? My mind went back to the file. I didn't recall the name. Was she interviewed by the police? I doubt they took much notice of her. But if you can stand the stench, she might be worth a chat. What's her story? Adele twirled the lollipop stick against the side of her head. Says she saw him that night is all. I tried to keep my voice level. The killer? Not just the killer, Adele grinned. The devil himself, so she says. Chapter 19 Those little slices of death. How I long for them. Loathe them, isn't it? Miss Debney stared at me. When she smiled, her bloodless upper lip, furred with the trace of a moustache, exposed a cemetery of rotten teeth. You know Edgar's work? Oh, but you are most welcome here, then. She spread her arms, and I tried to concentrate on breathing through my mouth. The name of her hillside cottage, Annabel Lee, ought to have given me the clue as to this former English lecturer's obsession. It had been scrawled on a garden gate glazed with webs and then daubed again in dripping yellow paint on the front door. A door that, when opened, I'd almost reeled back from. It's difficult to describe the smell. I'd been the officer first on scene at countless deaths, natural and otherwise. The reek of a putrefying corpse is a rankness that's hard to get used to. 
but the stench of poor Miss Debney's cottage was something else. A damp, stale, fetid odour, suggestive of the living death of this shunned woman. Sleep, she nodded. A curse to both Edgar and myself. Do you know, Mr. Jericho, I do not believe that I have actually slept at all in the past fifteen years. Now, you'll tell me that such a thing is physiologically impossible, but I assure you that the human mind can overcome the base needs of the body. In point of fact, I have not eaten since the turn of the millennium. Looking at her, I could almost believe it. Dwarfed by the armchair in which she sat, the witch of Annabel Lee, as she told me the local children called her, appeared like some kind of skeletal puppet. Her clothes, marked with stains I didn't want to guess at, hung loosely from her bones. The sitting room was dark, windows pasted over with old newspapers, but still Miss Debney's face shone out, waxy in the gloom. I sat forward on the couch, careful not to touch its crusted cushions. There was no TV that I could see, no radio, no laptop, just pile upon pile of books. It made me think of my own trailer only a couple of days ago, and I wondered again at the change the deaths of three strangers had brought to my life. Trying to ignore the itching sensation that prickled my skin, I reached over and picked up a collection of short stories, tales of mystery and imagination. Were you awake the night your neighbour died, Miss Debney? I held up the book. Reading Poe, maybe? Edgar, she corrected. He calls me Una, and I call him Edgar. We have an understanding. That was why the college sacked me in the end. You see, I could tell my students what Edgar really meant in his tales and poetry, because he spoke to me. In spirit? She drew herself up. In person? Much as I enjoy the pleasing terror of his masterpieces, I do not believe in ghosts, Mr. Jericho. I am not a child, and I am not mad. But, in fact, Edgar did not come to me on the night of poor Mr. McAllister's passing. I was in my garden. She wafted a hand towards the window, beyond which weeds had grown waist-high and hidden things chirruped among the stalks. Counting stars and the spaces between stars. That must have taken a while, I said. I was distracted, her brow furrowed, by a light, not a star, but something new and earthly. A will-o'-the-wisp, down near the edge of the cliffs where old McAllister had his caravan. It was winter, you see, January, and that wisp had no business being where he was. Unlike me, the murdered man was no stranger to sleep, you understand? It was winter, I nodded, so the caravan park was closed up, and you're saying McAllister usually went to bed early? Made himself go, she cackled, a skin flint. Used to come up here to pick the blackberries in my garden. Even the children won't do that any more. Made sure he was all... Tucked up for the night by seven, lights out, heating off. Plenty of money, and yet insisted on freezing himself near to death. Did you know him well? Nobody knows anyone well, Mr. Jericho. What I knew, he chose to show me. McAllister, no family, no loved ones, except maybe that dog of his. Went everywhere together, thick as thieves. People were horrified by what was done to them, but I believe it might even have been an act of mercy. I assure you McAllister would not have wanted to live a moment longer than that beast. So you saw a light. What next? Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, Dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before, I said. She gave me a cool look. Finally, I decided I must be like Edgar C. Auguste Dupin and investigate the mystery 
of the incongruous light. You're not going to tell me McAllister was murdered by an outraged orangutan, are you? It was cold. The night wind screaming off the sea, she went on. I left my cottage and wandered down the hillside into Sweetview. All around me, the white caravan seemed to grow up out of the earth like rows of silent tombs. Everyone locked up, everyone dark except his. When I reached his door, I believe I heard something. McAllister, or perhaps what was left of him, weeping. You'll say I couldn't possibly have heard such a thing, not with the wind braying so, but I assure you, I heard. Although what she said was impossible, I nodded. McAllister had been killed by three puncture wounds to the heart. He would have died almost instantaneously, no time for weeping. I knocked, called out, a shadow there on the blind. She pointed at the papered window, and I really believe, in that moment, she was seeing the killer again. He was bending over something, and when I knocked, he turned his head towards the door. I knew then that it wasn't McAllister. McAllister never moved that way. What way? Patiently, she said. Her flaking brow creased again. Considered. McAllister was a lazy man, and like all lazy men, was easily startled. This man moved through the world as if every surprise had been anticipated and planned for. His shadow paused only for a moment to pull on some kind of mask, and then he came to the door, came to meet me. A mask. The balaclava. I sat forward. You didn't see his face? She hesitated, one crooked finger tracking down the side of her jaw. Yes, I saw his face. Forgetting myself, I took a breath and almost choked. He removed the mask. Miss Debney laughed. It was an awful sound, like the mad twittering of a caged bird. There was no mask. Don't you understand? What I saw on the blind, that was him pulling on his true face. There might have been something that looked human underneath, but that wasn't him. He is the darkness and the emptiness and the void. He is anarchy and desolation and the unmaking of things. He is the space between stars. He greeted me on white wings and flew inside the doorway. Did he speak? Entropy does not speak. It unmakes words. It unravels meaning. I closed my eyes in frustration. This was my second witness to the murderer, and I could get no more sense out of her than I could Webster. Why didn't he hurt you, Miss Debney? Why didn't he unmake you too? When I opened my eyes again, she was gripping her wrist and holding it out to me. He saw that I saw, and so he did this, she said, clasping the joint. He did this, he did this, he did this, and his white wings were stained red, and his hands were dark, and his face was true. Not even the conqueror worm may claim him, for he is the worm, and will feast until he is gorged. Do not think you can stop him, if you dare to try. He will wrap his wings about you and unthread your life until it lifts away like bits of string upon the wind. She sank back into her armchair, her hand still clutching that bony wrist. Do not bring him back here, Mr. Jericho. Do not make me see him again. Even Edgar is afraid of him. Before heading back to Bradbury End, I let Webster out for a run along the beach. I say run. The poor old boy plodded along beside me, snuffling at the sand. When some kids hurtled by, dragging a kite, he looked up and gave them a few fierce barks. Still a fair ground joke at heart. I reassured them that he was soft as butter, and they were all soon making a ridiculous fuss of him. I watched on. Memories of Webster the pup, my mum and I throwing sticks for him on the heath. Those ghosts almost as real to me as the Malinowski children who now stood watching me from the road. 
I met Sonia's gaze as she reached down and took her little brother's hands. Then I turned back to the sea. Lost as she was, Miss Debney had seen the killer. His face, the desolation, the void, the balaclava mask, his dark gloved hands, his wings. What had she actually witnessed in that doorway? Only one thing seemed certain. I'd been wrong. Yes, I had guessed that he had his rules, that the five Jericho victims would be his ultimate masterpiece, but I had also imagined that he must take some pleasure in sadism. Yet here was a witness, one he could easily have disposed of if he'd chosen to, and he had let her live. Did that suggest that the physical deaths of the five, even their desecrations, were unimportant to him? That there was some other purpose these murders might be serving? All I knew was that Miss Debney's survival had offered me a scrap of comfort. My family and my friends were safe. I did not believe the killer would come for them. It was a five-hour drive back to Bradbury End. I arrived at Harry's just as a car was pulling up to the curb. Spotting the Honda Accord, I felt a mixture of trepidation and relief. Face to face, I knew I didn't have a hope of keeping the case from D.I. Pete Garris, and although part of me yearned for his insight, another feared his intrusion. Unlike me, he was still a real detective, after all. I leaned over and opened Webster's door. He jumped out, circled Garris twice, then went to relieve himself behind Harry's hedge. I got out myself, unkinked my neck, and looked over at my old boss. What are you doing here, Pete? I'm not sure yet. He put his hands into his jacket pockets and glanced up at the sky. If you've got anything to do with it, probably destroy my career. So, come on then. Let's hear what sort of mess you've got yourself mixed up in. Chapter 20 I like what you've done with the place, Gary said, glancing around the trailer. Looking less like a hellhole fit to die in, anyway. I handed him a mug of strong black coffee. Thank God he hadn't asked for milk. I wasn't ready to share the contents of my fridge with him just yet. That little cardboard box could wait. I went and sat on the opposite side of the locker settee while Webster collapsed in the space between us. All Sal's work, I said. Did you ever meet Sal Myers? He smoothed down his tie his poppy tattoo winking from under his cuff. Honestly, he must have stocks in whatever company produced those paisley horrors. Your bosom friend of childhood? Yes, I bumped into her a couple of times when dropping off those case files you never look at. She seemed worried about you. Although, his washed-out blue eyes moved across my face, you appear to be doing better. Which begs the question... Why have I had your old man on the phone asking me to check in on you? Like Sal, he's a warrior. But it isn't only you that he's concerned about. He senses that this case you've taken on has the potential to spill over and harm the travellers. I've told him. Garris held up his hand. Tell me. Then, if I'm satisfied, perhaps I can get him to back off. I sighed. It was time, anyway. I needed a fresh perspective, and there was none better than Garris's. I took out my notebook and started flicking back through the pages. How did you find me? I asked. How did you find the epicenter of an explosion? He spread out his hands. You trace inwards from the devastation. You told me you were in Bradbury End, and so, after a late-night chat with Pi Jericho, I set out first thing. The first natural port of call for a policeman is the local cop shop. I met a couple of officers who had encountered your charming manners only yesterday. They said they'd seen you talking to a librarian. Not difficult to find his address. He reached into his jacket pocket and took out his well-thumbed notebook. Harry Morehouse. I know that name, don't I? There's a lesson here. When discussing cases after work in a confidential nook of the Three Crowns, Keep it strictly business, especially if your confidant is a teetotaler with a photographic memory. 
God, those boozy chats. I'm not even sure why I used to spill my guts to him. It wasn't as if Garris ever offered me much in the way of sympathy. Perhaps that was the reason. He filled the role of a kind of father confessor, promising neither absolution nor resolution, just allowing me the space to talk. The boyfriend from Oxford, right? I nodded. Garris put away his notebook and stretched his arms along the back of the settee. I believe you told me once that he... That was in confidence. Off the record, yes, I remember. Don't look so frightened, Scott. I have enough sadistic pieces of shit on my plate. I'm not interested in pursuing some poor boy who put a loved one out of his misery. I can understand that temptation myself. Good God, I can. In all our years together, there had been only a handful of times when I'd glimpsed the man behind the copper. I was probably the closest thing Garry's had to a friend on the force, and yet our relationship outside work had been almost exclusively a one-way street. I talked. He listened. But just occasionally, that impassive professional mask slipped. How is Harriet? I said quietly. Much the same as when you asked 48 hours ago. Only, no, that's not true. She's worse, yellow with it and pain like you wouldn't believe. I think we both know that it'll only be a matter of time before I have to abandon her to that bloody hospice. You won't be abandoning her, Pete. You've done your best. Oh, I know, he said. I have nothing to reproach myself for. There are just some killers that can't be hunted down and put behind bars, that's all. But... Let's get back to it. I think you have a story to tell. In the end, it didn't take as long as I'd imagined. From Jeremy Worth's introduction to Campbell to my interview that morning with Miss Debney, I placed everything before Garris, including my hazy theories as to the killer's motivations. My former mentor listened as he always had, not a hint of his thoughts crossing his features. I'd heard about the murders, of course, he said, as I finished up. McAllister and Paul's, anyway. They were plastered all over the media a few months ago. Police baffled, killer remains at large, heads must roll. Basically, a plague on all our houses. He sighed. All right. So let's start with what I think is an assumption on your part. That your ex-boyfriend just happens to be on the scene of a series of murders connected with your family history. When you were together... Did you ever discuss the story of the Jericho freaks with him? Maybe. I crossed my arms. I don't know. You're talking over a decade ago. So, you're saying his presence here is a coincidence? I thought I'd taught you to be suspicious of coincidences. Let's imagine, for a moment, that he is your outside suspect, by which I mean he's not a showman nor a long-time resident of Bradbury End. He became fixated with the story you told him. There are unresolved issues between you. He has killed before. You said yourself that Harry's was a mercy killing. I cut in. His father was in agony and was going to die soon anyway. The humanity behind that act doesn't fit the M.O. of these murders. And anyway, Harry had only just left me last night when I saw the killer across the street. If he had an accomplice... No. Pete... I know him. Harry could never... You knew him, Garris corrected. People can change a great deal in ten years. You know that better than anyone. I shook my head, pushing away memories of the man I had been when Garris first met me. Harry is the same person he was back in Oxford, I insisted. I'd know if he was capable of this sort of evil. Perhaps... It's true that you can read people better than anyone I've ever worked with. He stated it not as a compliment, but as a plain matter of fact. All right, then. Let's assume your personal feelings are not clad in your judgment. Another coincidence needs to be considered. Your father tells me that a certain far-right child killer has been making your life a misery. Do you think Kerrigan could be involved? I hesitated. I think he may have a role... But the whole feel of the case is wrong for Kerrigan. The victim selection, the theme of the recreations, the care taken over the staging of the bodies. 
Kerrigan's a vicious thug. He doesn't have either the brains or the patience for this sort of thing. Again, what do we think of him as an accomplice? Why would he? I said. And anyway, what advantage could he be to the killer? As a way to distract you? It's possible, I suppose. But look, Kerrigan started turning up at the fair long before I became involved in the case. The timing just doesn't work. And although it's true that he told me I was in for a surprise, that he'd played me somehow, every mention I've made of the murders he's interpreted as a reference to the Malinowski case. Anyway, forget that piece of trash for a minute. There's something I need you to see. I went to the fridge and returned with a cardboard box. I let Garris open it, peeling back the greaseproof paper with the tip of his pen. His eyebrows rose only a little when he saw the contents. From your summary, I'm assuming this is a piece of Ajay Mahal. I nodded, and after sniffing the bleached paper, he returned the box. I'm sorry, Scott. I have to report this. But what is there to report? I asked. You know as well as I do, there won't be any forensics to be gleaned from it. All I have is a useless piece of physical evidence in the ramblings of a convicted paedophile. Apart from the calling card of the artist's mannequin left in the trailer window and the initials of the bridge inscription carved into the bodies, there is nothing to link these victims, either to each other or the historical tragedy. What I've told you is all supposition and theories. But if you can look me in the eye and say that an official investigation started right now is more likely to yield results than me working alone, I'll happily hand it over. He shifted uncomfortably in his seat. Fingers worrying at that paisley atrocity around his neck. Come on, Pete. Give me three days. If I've got nowhere by then, you can take it off my hands. That inscrutable gaze again. I did my best not to look away. I knew that whatever decision he made, sentiment would play no part in it. You've changed, he said at last. Or maybe what I mean is, you've come back. I suppose I'm only sorry that none of the cases I brought you worked that miracle. If you want to know the truth, Scott, the way things were going after you got out of prison, I thought you'd be dead within the year. I'm not usually one for regrets. Wishing you might have acted differently is the ultimate waste of time. But I do regret making you lead interviewer on the Malinowski case. Within a couple of years, I might have trained you to control your emotions better, but your temperament was not suited to dealing with scum like Kerrigan. It wasn't your fault, sir, I murmured. Something I'd said to Sal came back to me then. Words spoken when she'd warned me that if I went back inside, I'd probably end up dying there. In there, out here, what's the difference? I'd known myself that guilt and anger were killing me by degrees. Now things had changed. I'll give you your free days, Garris sighed. Make good use of them. I will. We went to the small dining table and I spread out the crime scene photographs. So, any thoughts? Garris traced his finger across the letter A carved into McAllister's forehead. You said these represent the initials of the inscription on Traveller's Bridge. Remind me. Aclinis, Falsis, Animus, Meliora, Recusat. The mind intent upon false appearances refuses to admit better things. What is he trying to tell us with that? Isn't it just a way of linking the victims to the tragedy? I asked. Perhaps. But a mind intent upon false appearances... Is there something beneath the superficial staging of these murders? Some deeper meaning beyond a psychopathic obsession to recreate the Jericho freaks? Even madmen have their motives, Scott. Do you mean a hatred of people whose society perceives as different? I wondered aloud. Maybe he has a deformity himself and projects his self-loathing onto his victims. Or he sympathises with them and it's an act of revenge. Garrish shook his head. But I didn't really mean that, either. Don't you get the feeling that there's a purpose behind all of this bloodshed? 
something separate from the acts of murder and mutilation. I think your idea that he takes no pleasure in any of this could be true. There's a functionality to it all that shines through. I don't know whether that's particularly comforting, I said. Garris gave me a long look. Oh, it's not comforting at all. It's profoundly disturbing. And unless you catch him, I think much worse horrors are to come. Chapter 21 Have you considered Campbell himself as a suspect? Garris asked. I have, I said. But look, that job the other cons did on him, damaging his spine, I don't think he'd even have the strength to overpower a pensioner like Agatha Poole, let alone a working man like McAllister. Plus, I pointed to a black and white shot of Adya Mahal's flat in Lincoln. Three stories up and the lift was out of order the night Adya died. There's just no way. The mind intent upon false appearances, Garris quoted at me. You're suggesting that because I'd think such a punishment was fitting for a man like Campbell, he played up to it somehow, made his condition appear worse than it actually was. He knew all about the Malinovsky case, didn't he? How you served up what you thought was justice to Kerrigan... I felt my insides tighten. Then he was taking a big fucking risk inviting me to his house. Anyway, we know he can't have been putting it on. You sent me the details of his injuries. Perhaps he's made the miraculous recovery. Garris gave a wry smile. Unless he has an accomplice, of course. Often, in cases where two killers act in concert, there will be a dominant personality and one that watches on the kind of voyeur to the sadism. We've considered whether Kerrigan could be involved. Perhaps Campbell paid him to live out his twisted fantasies. Or indeed this Miss Barton. Do you think she'd be physically capable? I thought back to the small, scarred woman who had led me through Campbell's pederast gallery. Had her quiet revulsion been an act? I didn't think so, but a mind intent upon false appearances... She might have the strength, I admitted. I believe Adji was drugged before she was killed, and if Miss Barton took McAllister by surprise, but you're talking about a kind of devotion that goes beyond anything I've ever heard of. It's love, Garris said bitterly. If you'd been in CRD a little longer, you might have seen the degradations love can lead to. We don't know what history these two have together, but she's been with him since he was a little boy. Most successful marriages don't last that long. But, OK, I admit the MO is completely different from Campbell's past crimes and the physical limitations do seem to rule him out. So, we're back to someone in the travelling community or a Bradbury resident. It's such an obscure story, it's unlikely someone other than Campbell stumbled upon it and became obsessed. Except he isn't. Gary stopped sorting through the photographs and looked up at me. I'm sorry? It's odd, I said, but from the moment he handed the case over to me, he seemed to lose all interest in it, almost as if a burden had been lifted from his shoulders. He hasn't called for updates, isn't interested in my progress, but when I was wavering about accepting his proposal, he... Yes? He looked frightened, terrified that I might refuse... And now, total indifference. Garris flicked his forefinger against the file. But this isn't indifference. This is the compulsive and costly accumulation of evidence. And there was risk involved in amassing it too. If one of the officers he contacted hadn't taken his bribes and had reported him, he'd probably be facing court right now. I know, I said. Right from the beginning, I've had this feeling that Campbell hasn't been telling me the whole truth about his interest in the case. It feels artificial, somehow. I can't explain it. There's too much about this business that can't be explained. In fact, one of the only things that seems certain is that this isn't our murderer's first outing. As you've said, the lack of DNA is indicative. I wonder, have you considered a hibernating serial killer? I nodded. Yes, I think these killings are discreet. 
They have their set historical pattern that he would attempt to replicate, but it's such a fully formed idea, recreations of past tragedies, and so neatly executed, it feels like a template that's been used before. And if it has, then my guess is that his past murders were either never discovered or, as you say, happened a long time ago. So long ago, they've slipped from our memory. Or we didn't appreciate them for what they were at the time, Garris said. Because like now, the victims appear to be unconnected and so the murders were never linked. So he repeats this pattern every few years, maybe even every few decades. That must take huge self-control. Well, we know he has that from the arrangement of the crime scenes, Garris said. And there have been many cases of serial killers with big gaps between their activities. If our man fits the typical profile, he's likely to be a loner without a family or normal home life, although he may give the illusion he has one. Then there are all the typical traits. Early age trauma, a record of petty offences from his childhood, theft, incidents of arson, maiming and killing animals, you know, the sort of thing. He may appear superficially charismatic, while having the psychopath's ability to mimic any emotions he doesn't actually feel. I'd say that goes double for this guy. Garris tapped his pen against the reports. This sense of control will be evident in all his actions. I scribbled a few lines in my notebook, nodding along as he spoke. There were new insights here, but much of what he said accorded with my own feel for the case. Still, it was good to have my theories validated. I'll take a look in all the usual databases, he said. See if I can spot him among any old unsolved murders. I'll also take a look at the Vicks. I think you're right, Scott. They must be connected somehow. Finally, he picked up the last photo ever taken of us together, exiting the station after our second interview with Lenny Kerrigan. His lips set into a thin line. The Tiro woman shot this, didn't she? She did. Bloody paparazzi. I know she was bothering you after you left prison. Is she still buzzing around? I haven't seen her for weeks, I said. Well, that's a blessing anyway. Amen. So, any final thoughts? Garris stood back from the table where the photos and reports were found out like a kaleidoscope of pain and misery. Only that... He seemed to struggle for the right words. It doesn't seem real. Not like an actual case. Know what I mean? I agreed. Everything about these murders had an air of heightened reality, almost like a detective story. It was as if the players had all been assembled on stage, the set appropriately dressed, the actors' lines rehearsed. Everyone just waiting for the detective to show up and go through the motions. Only he had turned up late, missing the curtain. I said as much to Garris and he agreed. Although, what good that idea does us, I don't know. Anyway, I shall be heading back home. Harriet sends her best wishes, by the way. Oh, and Scott? Yes. Once you find him, you hand him over to us. You understand? Of course. He stood at the door for a while, his gaze never leaving my face. I hope to God you do. Webster stirred as he pushed the door open. In the next moment, the juke was halfway across the trailer, barking his head off. Harry stood on the step, fist raised as if about to knock. I caught hold of Webster's collar and hauled him back. Sorry, I shouted, hushing the juke as best I could. He'll like you once he gets to know you, I promise. Harry's frightened gaze flipped between Webster and Garris. Hello, he said, holding out his hand. Harry, Morehouse. Garris shook his hand. Pete Garris, I'm a friend of Scott's. I've heard a lot about you, Harry. He looked back at me over his shoulder as I settled Webster. One more thing before I go, Scott. Remember your Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, Mr Morehouse. Harry moved aside to let Garris pass. A few seconds later, we heard the putter of his Honda turning out of the cul-de-sac. With Webster quieted, we stood looking at each other for a moment, smiling tight smiles. 
I'm sorry about last night, we said together and burst out laughing. Hugo, I said. He ran fingers through that mop of mousy hair. I overreacted, running off like that. You had every right, I said. I guess I've just been a bit edgy lately and I didn't expect to find anyone in here. But I appreciated the notes. Until I saw it, I was thinking of packing up and leaving. No! He came forward and Webster stirred at my feet. I... I'm glad you stayed. I knelt beside the old jook and gestured for Haz to join me. Very gingerly, he got to his knees, the look of stark terror on his face making me laugh again. I'd forgotten how scared he was of dogs. His bark really is worse than his bites. Like his owner, then, Harry said, a nervous smile breaking out. Just stroke him here, right behind his ear, and I swear he'll love you forever. The low grumble emanating from Webster's belly gradually segued into delighted panting as Harry's fingers got to work. Pretty soon they were both grinning at each other. He's a cheap date, I nodded. Hey, Harry swatted my shoulder. Which one of us was that directed at? Take your pick. Where did he come from, anyway? he asked. Webster was now showing his belly, a geriatric pooch reverting to his puppyhood. You didn't bring him with you. A friend dropped him off, I murmured. The one that just left? He laid his hand against his cheek. I'm not sure I like the look of him. Who is he? He's easy to misread. That was Detective Inspector Pete Garris. I sighed. One of the best coppers you could ever hope to meet. And my old boss. I suddenly felt tired of secrets. For his own sake, I didn't want to expose Harry to the complete reality of my world, but to keep everything from him, every facet of who I was and what had happened to me in those years since Oxford, that was no basis for starting again. If that was, in fact, what we were doing here. You were a police officer? he asked. Are you still... No. Not for a while now. Why? What happened? As our hands rolled through Webster's fur, our fingertips touched. He didn't pull away. I messed up, I said. It didn't end well. I'm sorry, Harry said quietly. I bet you were a good police officer. I laughed. I was a horrifically bad police officer, but a pretty decent detective. Of course you were. You always beat me at Cluedo. Used all your little tricks as well, I bet. Funny, I never thought of you as a detective, though. So, what was he doing here? Was it a social call? I almost bust a gut. The idea of Pete Garris paying a social call was like the ghost of Christmas yet to come popping in for a friendly natter. Now your friends, do you fancy taking this old boy for a walk? I asked. There are some things about me you probably need to know. Chapter 22 It was quiet in the woods. The dank drizzle that had followed me from Anglesey had finally lifted and the last hour of daylight blazed among the treetops. We hadn't spoken much since leaving the bungalow. In fact, Webster had been a welcome distraction, trotting arthritically after the sticks Harry threw for him, allowing me some space to get my thoughts together. Something Garris had said kept nagging at me. Remember your Sherlock Holmes. It had been a while since I'd read those old adventures, but one phrase of the great detective resonated. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. I glanced at the man walking beside me. I'd assured Garris that there was no way Harry could be involved. I knew him, had loved him, still loved him, perhaps. But, as my mentor had said, a decade is a long time. Could something have happened to Haz in those years? Some trauma that had twisted him into the faceless monster Miss Debney had seen in McAllister's doorway? Everything I knew about this kind of killer, how their perversions and fixations were moulded in the crucible of abusive childhoods, told me that Harry's involvement was unlikely. As I'd pointed out to Garris, 
The murder of his father had been an act of compassion, not ritualistic carnage. But still, doubt lingered. I was stiff after my long drive, joints cracking as I bent down to take my turn with Webster's stick. Beautiful place, I said. I was being spoiled today. First that wild panorama of the Welsh Bay, and now the rustic charms of an English woodland. A light breeze crackled the canopy of sycamore and oak. Pine needles snapped underfoot. Away to our left, a hidden stream chattered among the reeds. Harry nodded. All part of the smiling face of Bradbury End. Don't be fooled, though. Fly tippers are always dumping their rubbish into the river. There's a planning application the council are waving through to dig up half the forest for a new supermarket. Oh, yes, and the police are here every Saturday night, chasing the doggers out of the bushes. Of those three, I sympathise most with the last, I said. Of course you do. You always were a champion of the underdog. We looked at each other and burst out laughing again. Anyway, talking of the police... It was just a chance thing, I shrugged. After leaving Oxford, I tried a few different jobs. None of them really took. That's right, Scott. Start as you mean to go on. All the pretty lies and omissions. I made a fist and remembered some of the blood that had flecked those knuckles in my thug-for-hire years. I just didn't want to go back to the fair, I said. I don't know why. Only that it would feel like a kind of defeat. Harry crouched to collect the stick from Webster. Did you blame me? What? No. Why would you even... Because I was probably the only thing keeping you there. After Dad. He stroked Webster's tattered ear, kept his head down. After I left, you had nothing much to stay for. You hated your studies. You were never great at making new friends. So... You drifted? I did. And if only you knew what I drifted into, Has, I'm not sure you'd be looking at me with such sympathy right now. If I'd stayed, we might have figured out the future together, I suppose, he said. I hunkered down beside him. Our hands touched as I took the stick and launched it between the trees. You didn't owe me anything, Has. Not an explanation, certainly not any duty of care. I was just grateful for the time we had together. His face tightened. We stood, brushed off our knees and continued down the path. So, he said, what happened next? Because as I remember things, you were never all that comfortable around authority. What got Scott Jericho into a police uniform? There was a layered question. The steps that led me to become Detective Constable Jericho were simple enough but the motivations behind them, conscious and unconscious. I guess a psychiatrist might interpret joining the force as the ultimate fuck you to my father. It isn't that travellers are actively hostile to authority, but almost every minority has a complex history when it comes to the police. It's certainly not a career option taken by any showman I've ever heard of. And by joining up, I'd known that returning would not be an easy option. Garris interview me, I said. I'd been a witness to a case he was investigating. I managed to provide him with a few details that led to an arrest. What kind of case? A child murder. Some poor street kid apparently robbed and cut up and dumped in a canal. The theory was a drug deal gone wrong. The kid was a pusher on the lowest rung of the ladder and the police suspected he'd been dipping into a take. The state of the body seemed to back up the idea. He'd been... I glanced at Harry. This was his first glimpse into the shadows of my world. Made an example of. What do you mean? His face had been mutilated. His nose cut off. Jesus. He looked suddenly very pale, which was actually a kind of comfort. I doubted if the killer of Robert McAllister would be so squeamish. How did you get involved? I was passing by the canal that night. I happened to hear a splash and then saw a man leaving the scene. By the time I reached the towpath, the body had floated out of sight and I just assumed it was someone dumping their trash. 
The place was like a graveyard for broken fridges and busted mattresses. Anyway, when I heard about the kid, I contacted the officer in charge, D.I. Peter Garris. I'd only seen the man from the back, but what I told Garris changed pretty much everything. Well? Don't leave me hanging. The man had a pronounced indentation in his hair, I said. Right around the back of his head at the level of his ears. Grey-haired, around 50, so probably not a baseball cap. Something he wore habitually, possibly for work. As the streetlight caught him, I also saw this light mud splatter on the back of his left trouser leg. It started at his ankle and reached just below the back of his knee. And? My guess was a hotel porter. The indentation was from his cap. The mud splatter from where he opened taxi doors for hotel guests and then the taxi's back wheels sprayed him a little as it pulled away. Whichever side of the street the hotel was on, he'd always be facing the guest and away from the driver as he opened the door, so it would always be the left leg that got dirty while the right remained clean. He hadn't changed his clothes, so he'd probably come straight from work to meet the kid, which meant the hotel must have been reasonably close by. Garris didn't give anything away while we chatted. He just thanked me for my time and showed me out. It was only later that I heard the kid's stepfather worked as a porter at the Majestic and that the kid had been threatening to tell his mother about the years of abuse he'd suffered at the bastard's hands. Harry blew out his cheeks. Wow. So how did things develop from there? My regular back then was a pub called The Three Crowns. It wasn't far from the local cop shop and I'd often see police in there after finishing their shift. I didn't tell Harry that I'd chosen that particular pub because it was such a favourite of the force. After finishing my own activities for the day, I'd wanted a place where none of my underworld associates would choose to gather. Garris spied me in a corner one night and we got chatting. I think I'd impressed him by identifying the porter. I'm not surprised. You always had sharp eyes. I couldn't get away with anything when we were together. Harry caught himself and I quickly filled the pause. Garris asked me about my background. I told him that travellers are great observers and are pretty good at weighing people up at a glance. After that night, we met fairly regularly and he eventually started discussing some of his current cases. General things at first, but I always seemed to pick up on a thread or two that he'd missed. It took maybe six months for him to persuade me to fill in the application form. So, why did you? Weren't you satisfied in your current work? Beating up crooks for other crooks? No, Harry. My job satisfaction wasn't all that high. You know, I'd always like puzzles, I said instead. Of course, I had to do my time in uniform before I could join Garris in CID. But even at street level, there were problems to solve. Sometimes what appeared to be a simple mugging could be more surprising than the most brutal serial murder. It's human nature that's fascinating, not the crimes themselves. I can see why that would appeal to you, he said. It was the human drama you loved in stories. I think that's why it broke your heart to pick them apart. I'd never really thought of it that way, but Harry was right. I've always been a sucker for a good story. Garris used his influence to fast-track me through uniform, I went on. I wasn't much used to him outside CID. That kind of preferential treatment didn't do me any favours with my colleagues, though. They started calling me the fortune teller. Let me guess, because your success solving cases was almost spooky? That was what they said to my face, I nodded. But it was a backhanded compliment. There was jealousy about how I'd progress so quickly and then someone found out about my background. Couple that with the rumour I was gay, we get them casting me as the effeminate fortune teller. All the usual chauvinism and homophobia, but now with an extra layer of prejudice against travellers. It was a heady mix. I'm so sorry, Scott. Did Garris try to put a stop to it? I shook my head. Not his style, but he liked you. Honestly, I shrugged. I'm not sure he likes anyone much, except for his wife. He was... I took the stick from Webster and swatted the tall grass that fringed the path. 
fascinated by me, I guess. I don't know. I was useful to him anyway. We had emerged into a clearing, the pine needle path cutting away to a distant band of trees, the bruised sky darkening overhead. The river sounded closer now, though it remained hidden behind a curtain of swaying reed. As Harry spoke again, I glimpsed three figures waiting up ahead. They sat together on a low stone parapet. Sonia and her brothers, legs dangling, arms folded, charred faces turned towards me. My ghosts waiting for me on Traveller's Bridge. So, what happened? Harry asked. Why did you leave the police? The children cocked their heads as if listening. I let a killer escape, I said softly. I failed and... Away to my right, beyond the hidden river, something sparkled among the trees. A bright pinpoint of moving light disappearing now between the boughs. The same reflective glimmer I felt certain that I'd seen in the woods around Marco's diner. Chapter 23 A light in the trees that seemed to follow me, no matter the forest. Was I actually losing it? I suppose I'd come to view my haunting by the Malinowski kids as a kind of justice. They had seeped between the cracks of my sanity and taken up residence in my broken mind. I could accommodate them, rationalise them, even, because their presence was no more than I deserved. But this pursuing glimmer, that I couldn't make sense of. And then again, maybe it wasn't a psychological tick at all. I'd taken more than my share of blows over the years, fights with the Joskins at school when I'd been a bratty, self-conscious, fairground chavvy, endless fists to the skull in darkened alleys during those thug-for-hire years, then the inevitable knockabout to any young constable experiences. Maybe a bit of wiring had finally come loose, sparking the illusion of reflected light. Except for that first time near the roadside diner, Kerrigan had seen it too. Are you okay? Harry asked, following my gaze. Yeah. I turned back to him, shaking my head. Doesn't matter. What were we saying? You were talking about why you left the police? I glanced back at the bridge. There were three kids, I said softly. Sonia, Pietro and Tomas. I was the night duty detective and took the call. It took under ten minutes to describe how my life, and more importantly, the lives of the Malinowski family, had come apart. My voice sounded detached throughout, as if my actions since that night hadn't tortured my every waking moment. It was a deliberate choice. If I'd shown the anguish and grief I was feeling, I knew Harry would have comforted me, and I didn't deserve his comfort. Still, when I reached the part where I beat Kerrigan to a bloody pulp, I pulled back on the detail. It was a cowardly thing to do, but I couldn't risk frightening Harry away. You went to prison, he said in a small voice. I got out a couple of months ago. Scott, it's fine. I deserve jail and more for what I did. And you got more inside, didn't you? A mean little voice whispered inside my head. You reacted how anyone might have, given the circumstances, Harry murmured to see those little kids like that. It was no excuse, I said. I was supposed to be a professional. I promised Jan Malinowski that I would put the bastard who murdered his babies behind bars. Instead, I assaulted our prime suspect, making any evidence we had against him next to useless. Any barrister worth their salt could have ripped our case to shreds after that, and the CPS knew it. And so they turned their attention to me. I was the one who ended up inside, and all I gave Kerrigan was the keys to my house. I failed Garris and my colleagues, but most of all, I failed those kids. Finally, my voice cracked and Harry reached for me, as I knew he would. I put up my palm, gesturing him away. How was it? he said. Inside? It was justice, I said simply. We stood there, letting the burble of the stream fill the stillness. He was searching for the right words, the right questions, 
and I didn't know how to help him. Maybe this whole ridiculous dream of us getting back together would always flounder at these moments. So you went back to the fair, he said at last. It was the only place I could go back to. The only people who would take me back, anyway. He flinched at that. So, what are you doing now? You're not just a researcher for Campbell, are you? There's something else going on here. Harry didn't possess the skills of a detective, but he had his own subtle instincts. He had always known when there was something going on with me. At that moment, I felt an almost irresistible urge to tell him everything, to roll the dice and see what came of it. But then I thought back to my debrief with Garris. We had looked dispassionately over the unfolding horror of the case, talking theories and deductions as if these weren't individual lives sadistically cut short. Did I really want Harry to be a part of that darkness? And did I want him to see how drawn I was to it? I am looking into something for Campbell, I said. And it isn't just the tragedy of the Jericho freaks. But it is related in some way, and I... Something criminal, he frowned. Was that why Garris was here? Scott, I don't understand any of this. How can the accidental deaths of five people over a century ago be something the police are interested in now? Do they think it wasn't an accident? I mean, even if they did, all this happened so long ago. Harry, I just... I need you to trust me, OK? He didn't hesitate. Of course. I've always trusted you. Then why didn't you stay? The question hovered on my lips. I am working a case, I said. And if I could, I'd rather keep you out of it. But why? Is it dangerous? It is to a small number of people, but that doesn't include you. Then why? Look, there are parts of a police officer's life that he never shares. Not with his partner, not with his friends. Because he knows if he peels back the surface and shows them what the world is really like, they won't thank him for it. They might even come to hate him. They won't want to, they'll fight against it, but the resentment will always be there. No one can cope with too much reality, you see. How do you cope with it then? He asked. Alone? I'll do my best. I think he wanted to keep questioning me, but by then we'd reached Traveller's Bridge and I'd squatted down to read the inscription. It had been eroded by the years. The letters of Aclinus falsis animus meliora recusat worn shallow. I ran my fingers across the motto, scraping away some of the moss that had overgrown it. Then I stood and looked over the parapet into the stream, where once a raging torrent had claimed old slip-jointed Jericho in his caravan, now little more than a narrow brook burbled between the piers. They diverted the main river a few years ago, Harry said, as if reading my mind. It all looked pretty much forgotten. I picked a pebble from the bridge deck and dropped it into the dark green waters. Makes me wonder why they're making such a fuss of the anniversary, he shrugged. It has a kind of fairy tale fascination for the locals, I think. The contortionist and the electric lady and the balloon-headed horror and the rest, all drowning in their river. Every town has its ghost story. Except that these were real people, I said. They were. He joined me at the parapet. Only, we're all characters in each other's stories, aren't we? That's why it's so surprising when the people we know do things we don't expect. It feels as if they've betrayed the role they have in our narrative. I mean, look up there. Against the purpling twilight, a breathtaking display was in progress. A billow of birds, bulging and breaking and reforming in the air. As we watched, the swarm suddenly arrowed towards the earth, and in one dark swoop winnowed the tall grass of the clearing. Then the flock swept on, high above our heads, losing its shape beyond the trees. Most young birds return to their nests after their first flight, Harry said. But not swifts. Once they start flying, they don't stop. Not for two years or more. They sleep and eat on the wing, taking insects as they go, swooping down for mouthfuls of water from the rivers. 
They leave their homes and their parents behind forever. He turned to me and touched the side of my face. You were supposed to be like that, Scott. You were supposed to fly forever. I cut my hand over his. Harry. I can't say why I didn't see the house when I first stepped onto the bridge. It was certainly large enough. A great black ruined presence. The struts of its roof poking through the trees like broken fingers. True, it had been half swallowed by the forest and the light was failing, but it stood only a few hundred meters from the river. There was a sort of furtiveness to it, as if those boarded up windows enjoyed watching us from the shadows. What is that place? Harry followed my gaze. The old Mathers Hillstrom house. Bit creepy, eh? Hillstrom? Ancestor of our current mayor. The same Gideon Hillstrom. Who built the bridge? That's the guy. I think he built the house a few years later. The Mathers were distant cousins who bought the place from the Hillstroms a couple of decades back. It's been falling to pieces for thirty years or more. But why would Gideon want to build a house overlooking the river where five people died? Harry shrugged. It's a pretty spot, I suppose. I shook my head. What happened to it? Yeah, that's another Bradbury and ghost story. In the late seventies, the last of the Mathers came to live here. The father had died in a car accident the year before, and apparently, their family home held too many memories. So his widow decided to move to the ancestral pile. She had one son, a boy of about eight. That local historian I mentioned, Roebuck, he knows all there is to know about what happened, which isn't much. Mother and son kept to themselves and were rarely seen in the town. I think the kid was homeschooled or something. Anyway, one night some local teens got drunk and came up here causing trouble. I guess by then the Mathers' house had got a bit of a reputation. You know what small towns are like. I'm beginning to know what Bradbury End is like. I muttered, not fond of outsiders. Harry gave a grim nod. It started with taunts and escalated to stone throwing and broken windows. The kid got spooked. I suppose after what happened to his dad, he felt protective towards his mother. Anyway, I don't know what he was thinking, but he wrapped some kind of cloth around an old broom handle, doused it in lighter fluid, and set it on fire. Next thing, the whole house is ablaze. Did they get out? I'm not sure. I think the kid survived, but maybe the mother didn't make it. I stared into the darkening doorway of the ruined house. All I could think of was the fire-blighted face of Miss Barton looking back at me. Chapter Twenty-Four. The rotted door yielded to my shoulder, and the breath of old house swarmed out to greet us. This wasn't the same kind of stink as Miss Debney's cottage. That had been the cloying odor of a living death. This was the smell of mold and absence and decay. We thumbed torchlight from our phones and swept it through the gloom. You'd think they'd lock up the place more securely, I said. My voice didn't echo, but seemed to sink into the emptiness. I reckon they've given up trying. Harry ran his light across flame-scorched walls covered with graffiti tags. On the floor. At the foot of the stairs, a couple of stained mattresses lay side by side, springs twirling through, full of the rusty promise of lockjaw. Anyway, the kids seem to have got bored of their local haunted house. Hardly anyone comes here now. Someone's been here, I said. Before going inside, I'd secured Webster's leash to one of the porch posts. He now gave us a weary blink and immediately sank his head to his forepaws. Harry and I stepped over the threshold, pushing through swags of spider web. We crossed the uncarpeted hall, careful to avoid the broken glass and discarded syringes that littered the floor. At the stairs, I nudged aside one of the mattresses with the toe of my boot, and examined the first footprint on the step. Trainer, size ten, fake brand. How can you tell? Harry asked. Pattern of the imprint. The circles are irregular and unevenly spaced. Brands take pride in that kind of nonsense. So, what does that tell you? Not much. Other than that, from the sharpness of the prints, he was here recently. 
Do you think it has anything to do with your case? It was then that I noticed the top-hatted stick figure carved into the newel post, its limbs set at odd angles, a two-dimensional echo of the artist's mannequin propped in Robert McAllister's trailer window. And below this, a penknife scratch of letters, A-F-A-M-R, the initials of the bridge motto. The faceless creature who had spared Miss Debney and slaughtered three others had been here all right, and the footprints belonged to him. As he'd turned to carve his calling cards, the outline of his right trainer had been scuffed and blurred in the dust. It could rule out an obvious suspect, I said. I followed the path of the footprints with my eyes. As I'd said to Garris, unless Campbell was a consummate actor, there was no way he was capable of walking up a flight of stairs unaided. And Miss Barton, those tiny feet slopping around in a pair of size 10 trainers, the image was almost laughable. I'd taken the first couple of steps when Harry grabbed the back of my jacket. What are you doing? This whole building could come down at any moment. I have to check something out, I said. You can wait outside. I won't be a minute. His lips set into a thin line, but still he followed as I edged my way up the staircase. Like the killer, I kept away from the banister, my shoulder to the wall where the stair was more firmly planted. Nevertheless, the whole structure shuddered as we ascended. At the landing, I paused for a moment and took in the view of the hall. A large transom window above the door, now masked with bloated boards, must once have flooded light into this airy space. With the rich hue of its rosewood staircase, it would have been an impressive sight. I couldn't help being reminded of Campbell's palatial house in the Cambridge Fens, and suddenly the image of his pederast's gallery superimposed itself over this hollowed-out hall. The idea that, despite the footprints, he might have been the boy who grew up here, followed me into the first bedroom. Decades of decay couldn't disguise that this had once been a child's room. Stepping inside, I ran my fingers across tongues of curling wallpaper. Beyond a window glazed with webs, the sun had vanished, and a shaft of milky moonlight shone against the wall. Here I could make out fire-damaged fauns and satyrs, sea serpents and medusas. Had this been a young Ralph Campbell's inspiration for a lifetime's devotion to history? Moving to the window, I rubbed the circle in the soot-blackened pane. Directly below the glint of the stream and the white arch of the bridge, almost spectral in the gloom. For a lonely child shut up here, with only his mother for company, might he have developed a fascination for this view and the local legend that lay behind it? An obsession twisted in some way by the trauma of the fire he had started. Both Garris and I had considered that the murders were not an end in themselves, but parts of a design that had some larger purpose. Could it be that the killer was trying to reclaim something of his childhood in these ritualistic acts, staging his victims like offerings to the past? The idea had its attractions, but again, I came back to the fact that it couldn't have been Campbell or Miss Barton who carved the figure and initials on the newel post and then climbed those stairs. I was still looking down at the bridge when the light caught my eye. There it was again, the shimmer in the trees. Only, was it different this time? Two pinpricks of reflected illumination now. I motioned Harry to join me at the window. Do you see that? He glanced down to where I was pointing. I held my breath. I'd thought Kerrigan had seen it too, but was that just wishful thinking? Maybe I really was losing my mind. The light, he said, and I let go of my breath. What is it? I'm going to find out. I took him by the shoulders and stationed him where I'd been standing. Wait here. But Scott... I moved as quickly as I dared across the groaning floorboards and into the corridor. The stairs juddered as I took them two at a time. Skirting the used needles and rancid mattresses, I paused at the door. Whatever was waiting out there, I wanted to surprise it, and so took a moment to catch my breath. It was then that an ugly thought ran through my head. Just a few days ago, guilt and grief would not have allowed me to stand in this burned-out shell. The flashbacks to the Malinovsky home would have overwhelmed me. 
Was I beginning to leave the ghosts of Sonia and her brothers behind? The idea made me feel sick. I threw open the door. There, beyond the bridge, the lights still waited. They seemed duller now, weaker. And unlike earlier today, there were definitely two pinpricks shining out. As I started across the porch, the lights began to flicker between the trees. They were moving, retreating into the depths of the forest. Then suddenly, they seemed to swing downwards, and in the next moment disappeared altogether. I swore under my breath and plunged on, making for the spot where I had first glimpsed them. Behind me, where...